All right. I'm just going to adjust my camera adjust angle. Your atti- adjust your attitude. Do I look? Do I look straight and beauty look, in order? You look beauty, yeah. Great. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Make make sure the women that are watching have a good time as well. You know, as best they can. Exactly. This is for you, women. <laughs> <laughs> I had a beautiful message from Deanna, actually. She reached out and said it was really inspiring and uplifting. Yeah. I was like, wow, I'm impressed that you watched it all. She really um, liked it a lot. She, yeah. she, she, she watched and listened to the whole thing. And she was very inspired by it, she told me. so. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let, let's kick off. It's 4am okay. 4 over there where you are. Yeah, it's 4 a.m., but uh, it, there's been some construction in my building. So I don't mind doing it before the construction starts. So yeah. after, this week, after this one, I think we'll be okay to switch to a, a more normal. But, you know, with this, with this uh, quarantine shutdown, I'm kind of like on a two or three shifts of sleeping anyway. I sleep in chunks, you know, which is a natural has, thing. For has me. your life changed since no. the quarantine came in? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like I do the same thing as I do before, except I have less people that I'm that I'm spending time with, you know? Yeah. In my house, for instance, or something. But other than that, no, not really. Less travel, obviously. Yeah. And have you got a quarantine? Like Yeah. We're full on quarantine in Bucharest. Kind of armed police in the street scenario. Yeah, right out my window and I look out of my studio, I'm, I'm on the seventh floor and I look down in the, one of the main intersections and there's, there's army vehicles and they're stopping random cars and you have to yeah. have a declaration form that says, on this date, my signature is Anne Perrion, I'm going to the grocery store at this location, and, you know, and so, but I mean, mm-hmm. whatever has happened, there's been few cases in Romania and they're going to re- start to lift the restrictions soon is what, you know. Some of the airlines are going to start flying again in a couple of days. So that soon they said, but then there's a conflicting report because it said maybe May 15. Today is May, May 1st, May 1st. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So who knows? All right. Well, happy workers day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Labor day. Um, yeah. Over here is really good. More people are coming out of their houses now, which is a real shame. Oh, I think the quarantine times have been some of my favorite because we, um, we, we went out like wearing masks and washing our hands and all that kind of stuff. But we were going to cafes and restaurants and they kept a few open and driving down the streets with no other traffic in the road was like being in a zombie movie and we're, we're the only ones there. And it was yeah. kind of ecstatic because I mean, Bali is beautiful and everything, but it, it just has a deluge of people and tourists. So everywhere you go, there's, Usually, um, you know, if if you get a seat in the coffee shop, you're lucky if it's your favorite one. Oh that wow! Kind of so it's just be one of that really crowded. People. Yeah, and then the people come out of the coffee shop and they're like, "Oh, thank you for coming and supporting our business. Have a free cake, and here's something oh. you can take home." Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna miss it. Oh, you're gonna miss the the the, the having it all to ourselves. The scarcity <laughs> of people. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well. I think. I, I wanted to talk today um, in this. So last time out, we talked about Friesonism, right? Like this kind of yeah. tongue in cheek birth, tongue in cheek, but also secretly, maybe not really birth of a new artistic movement of realigning the arts towards the sublime mm-hmm. um, for the first time in maybe hundreds of years. Um, mm. I wanted to talk a little bit today about uh, the future of the world. Mm. And what surprised me in the feedback from our first videos is um, how people are really taking this as a, as a positive spot in a pretty bleak panorama. Uh, taking what is a positive taking spot? Our, taking our conversation and the themes okay, that yeah, we yeah. to look at as, as kind of a bright spot if, if we're all looking out into the sea of the future. Like if I open up YouTube in the morning and see what it recommends to me, even my reality tunnel, because we all have a different reality tunnel when we open up YouTube, right? The things that the algorithm thinks we like um, is is a pretty nerve wracking place. 
<laughs> like on my top, I don't, I don't know what you get because I'm Partner pretty curious. Lips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Top <laughs> column is like economic collapse. Then it's like, you know, yeah. the, the, the 5G and the lizard people are going to get us. And then the next one is, it, it just goes downhill from there. And I might have a playlist of music videos. Um, are, are you seeing the same thing? Or yeah, microchips and the vaccine that's coming that's going to be forced on everybody. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay, cool, cool, cool. I pretty much stay away from this stream of, of information. Like, I don't watch a lot of news, you know. Um, yeah. Not because I'm not interested. I think it's fascinating. I kind of yeah. like the, the, this this strange time kind of like it because it puts you on your edge and you know makes you obviously reflect everyone's reflecting on their lives on their relationships you know and it puts you in a real kind of like wait a minute i was like heading down this path of distraction and now nobody's distracted you know except they're distracted into the news cycle and yeah fear mongering yeah. and that kind of stuff you know so i think it's I, it's interesting if nothing else. Yeah. And I kind of like the chaos of it, you know, like for some reason there's something in me that's like, wow, how would, how do we emerge and what do we, how do we sneak through this forest? Totally. Like you, you've always been talking about these movies that, that are from order to chaos, right? Yeah. You've got the kind of modern encapsulated everyone in a, in their box, everyone in their place kind of world. And then it that's interesting ends. because, yeah. I, because the, the movies that really, I've always really liked since I was young are the ones that, are they, they go from order to chaos and that's the opposite of what we think, right? So for instance, the sheltering sky, um, or, or apocalypse now or dead man, or any of these movies are a journey from order to chaos. And it, it fascinates me. How do we cope and who shows up as, as with fortitude and in, you know, intestinal fortitude and who, who becomes a leader? Yeah. I just, I, I think it's fascinating. So, so we're, we're in it. We're in that mythical realm actually yeah. as a as a global society as a species right the the yeah. old way is kind of broken down at least temporarily there's a lot of argument it will go back by and large to what it was before with a few changes right that might be impediments um yeah. for some um but yeah we we are seeing who is showing up as a leader um who is showing up with with more chaos you know, like which which yeah. of your friends on your on your live stream are actually adding more chaos to the conversation, and which people are coming through with a little bit of clarity or a little bit of um, maybe consolation or shifting the the, the conversation to somewhere a bit um, more. Yeah, and it's interesting, more interesting because I think a lot of people are thinking, "Man, I'm quarantined and I got what I wished for, which is quality time." Right? <laughs> we wish for quality time <laughs> with ourselves, so I can you know plant that garden and I can you know, yeah. learn that language, I can do this kind of thing. And I bet you there's 98% of the people out there are kicking themselves saying, I'm wasting this time. I'm just sitting around watching Netflix and, you know, but then you, you and, and, and they, they see on social media, these other people are seem robust and very productive in this time period. But I think it's a natural <laughs> thing. And when this, when there's uncertainty in the air to just kind of sit in, in and look around, you know, yeah. and nobody's yeah. productive. I think nobody's productive right now. They're all kind of just like looking at their, their, their wife and, and uh, their kids and looking up in the air and, and, and going and day to day, you know, and the days are flying by, you know, <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Well, I, th I think I've seen some psychological research where when, when things actually break down and there is chaos and uncertainty, it, it becomes much harder to focus. Like, it's that's so kind true. Of like, there has to be a real intent and, uh, a trained mind to actually get and stick on one topic at the moment. When there's questions of like, I think after the, after the virus kicked in and I kind of got a gist of when it's going to hit and how bad might it be and who might be affected and you know how it's going to yeah. affect our travels and and plans and events for the year. The next thing my attention went to the went to was the economy. And that's yes. the next thing we're talking about collapse yeah. and so on. And and that like puts the puts the jitters in me on a much bigger level than oh, the that's virus a, yeah that's the worst contemplative thing the the, the yeah, economy yeah, is, yeah. is worse than the, the the virus ever be so so i've been sitting in the question of the economy and and personally i feel it's weird because on the one hand i'm relaxed and i feel like perhaps one message for anyone who's really not relaxed or um might get shafted by the economic turn that we're going through right now and going to end up in that 
I think the, the, the big thing I can say is something that resolves a lot of those problems is to find a work that resonates with your heart and that you're committed to no matter, you know, for richer or for poorer, you're mm -hmm. going to be in this line of work. I think so you're not dependent on what's going to happen to this company or this sector or you're working for an aircraft and they're all grounded for three months and you get laid off but you don't get chosen when they restart with less planes or whatever to, to have a work that no matter what burns down you can still apply yourself to it is kind of so in other words to to reassess your career path and if it's you're working for someone else and and you're reliant on that entity yeah, and to 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 try and shift into a more self sufficient type of entrepreneurial type work, or you know, yeah, so I make it personal. Mm -hmm. You know, like under the surface right now, I'm I'm kind of anxious about the world situation, and I'm watching the the I'm watching the worst doomsday videos on YouTube just to get close to it and see what they're saying. I'm watching the most worst doomsday um, what do they call it conspiracy theory videos. And then going out for a walk and like cleaning my head and then asking myself like, why, why are the conspiracy theories so popular right now? What's the psychology of that? Why are we, why are millions of people believing who was a nut job a year or two ago more than the prime minister or president of your country? Like why are these people mm -hmm. gaining traction? So, so I'm, I'm inquiring into all these different, different things and loops. Um, I, in the 2008, when that, when that economy went down, I got caught basically with my pants down. In, the, in your business, right? Or, very yeah. uncomfortable. I came. I was living in Argentina for a year, spent another three months in Brazil, and came back in the April of 2018. And my old plan was, before the kind of nomad era, the online era, my old plan was travel for a year, go back to England, get a job, save up some cash, do it again. Right. So I came back to England, but all of a sudden, I had four <laughs> very kind of you know incentivized good jobs lined up and they all fell through one after the other. I sat in interviews and it was the classic. It's not you. Um, we're just removing the post. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's, it's not you. We're, we're just not available for dating right now. And so, so I was, uh, I got, I got really stressed about it. And then I moved to Spain. I was like, well, fuck this. You know, if my old plan, plan A is not going to work, I'm going to go. I went in my car, I packed up some of my belongings. I went down to the South of Spain. Spain and started a two and a half year stint in Spain. Mm -hmm. And the first kind of jobs I got were uh, translating and interpreting. So I'd go with a lot of the retired British people that were living on the South Coast and go to the hospital with them and go to the police with them and help them with some, some language stuff. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that was, was as soon as I arrived in Spain, uh, the value of the pound, which was very high, it all of a sudden dropped. And these, pen <laughs> yeah, these pensioners who retired on a, on a healthy pension all of a sudden realized that they were, yeah. you know, right up against the wall in terms of what they could afford in the new kind of economy. And I lost my, I was, they couldn't afford really to pay me to go with them. So I lost that work and I had another job and I, it was just a domino effect of losing jobs. And for about six months, I was earning 400 euros a month and sleeping on a friend's couch. Hmm. And for another year or so, I was cycling tourists around on bikes and teaching a bit of English. And there was a period of that where I lost, when the English classes stopped for the summer and I lost that income, um, I was eating rice and beans. And if I had enough change for an onion, like that changed my dinner. <laughs> like it infused the dinner with the flavor of onion. So that, that was kind of my 1930s Great Depression period. You know, it was like my version of standing outside waiting for a loaf of bread for three hours. So you've been there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Best part of two years in that situation of are there any jobs, only subsistence stuff. Hmm. Like there's no career path for you here. So that, that was a real period of soul seeking and around that time was um i think tim ferris came out and um the first digital nomad podcast came out and i was listening to these guys who like yeah we started a business and we live in the philippines and it's all outsourced <laughs> to the philippines but we outsourced ourselves to the philippines so yeah we're just going to go scuba diving on the weekends and then we're going to go back in the office and crush it and i was i was like wow yeah we're gonna yeah, like that, that, that right? that's my direction no. So, so I felt my, I mean, if, if you're struggling with the, with the situation now, like those two years was a real, really painful 
cocoon kind of metamorphosis. And later on, I came out of that, which is like, I can't trust um, that some corporate career path mm-hmm. is going to have my back and last. Like I could just be expendable every eight or 10 years when there's a downturn. I need to carve yeah. my own way. It's interesting, you know, like uh, we're in North America, we're, it's built on work and like work is, is your identity and which is in England too, right? But it's, it's less so in, in other parts of Europe, you know, where they'll have siestas and this sort of thing, right? But um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. And, and, you know, it's because of all the stuff we have and we all know this, you know, the, all the accumulation of consumer goods that we have to work so hard, that we have to make so much money. In North America, you're kind of stuck if you're in most places because it's built on cars. So a, a big chunk of your life has to be maintaining and paying for and um, you know, owning a car or you know, a vehicle. And, it's, and, and so there's people that I, I, I would know in Vancouver that would do a two hour commute you know, from the, from the smaller suburbia towns outside of Vancouver and two hours in the morning through in, in insane traffic to get downtown Vancouver to work and then two hours coming back. And, you know, you ask them, well, why don't you just move into downtown Vancouver? You know, mm-hmm. and uh, well, because I can't afford it, but you could do without a car. You know, you could like dispense with that whole gas and, you know, all this kind of stuff and, and pay more rent, yeah. And I, I mean, that's my simplistic a, a approach to it. it. But simplifying is incredible. Like, and, and you know, when you, when you were you've been traveling, you you have one pair of shoes, you know. And the great thing about having one pair of shoes is you, you right don't have a choice. One pair of shoes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like when when Jordan says, "Hey, let's go to this restaurant," or "Let's go uh, for a walk in the park." you put your shoes on because that's all you have. It frees the mind, you know, like it's, if you don't have to think, well, should I wear these shoes or these shoes? And that's a, that's a simplification of simplifying, you know, but, yeah. but it's the, to, to simplify and to minimize is just phenomenal, you know? And I chased it because I know I, I was in the corporate world and I chased the house and cars and, you know, motorcycles and, and, and I want, and, and I would lease one. And then, and after a couple of years of payments are up, I get another one. I wouldn't just like, I always had a new, have to have a new car so that I can look like I've arrived in the world of adults, you know, and incredible that chasing that. So. Yeah. Yeah. That minimalism. I'm, um, we're working with, we're working with a gentleman in smack bang in the middle of the United States right now. And he, he's got that, ideal life you know the house with a white picket fence and he's yeah. had the proper job and paying into the 401k and is just absolutely it's it's textbook <laughs> or, or, almost mythical how normal yeah. america he's living his life and he's on this cusp right now of do i or do i not leave it all behind or can i is, is, yeah. is the the question underneath like can i do i have the the fortitude of emotions that i can deal with myself in the face of whatever comes up in that uncertainty Mm because he's lived almost five decades in this one context, which is extremely stable. And you say about simplifying your life, like some people are just like, yeah, I'm just going to get rid of everything. And I send it all to the skip. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Or give it away to friends. But that act of actually getting rid of all the stuff that you've emotionally collected, like imagine a record collection. If you start buying records at the age of, I don't know, eight or 10, and you yeah. build that up for a number of years to get rid of those pieces where everything I bought tells me a story of a moment in my childhood is like, you're really saying goodbye to the past when you shave off all that stuff. Yeah. It's super psychological. And it's, it, it, especially since, you know, we are spending our lives distracting ourselves from the, from the notion that someday we're going to die. And, and, you know, there are people who have, who have memories in storage for years that they'll pay, you know, a monthly storage, and, and they never in years go and open that box and look at these, these, you know, these mementos, they don't look at it, but they know they have yeah. it and they know they can look at it, you know, and there was something that was strong in me because I was keeping a box of keepsakes since I was a kid. Like my, I, 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 st- I still had the knife, for instance, that I used to wear in my side when I was this little, you know, wilderness kid. 
right, in, right. in, in a, in a, in a, uh, a, a deerskin sheath that I had made. I, I sewed it with an awl, you know, like, a, and, and, and I had that, but then, but you never look at it, you know, and then you think you have the memory of it, which is pretty powerful, you know? And, and, and so do you need the actual, you know, unusable memento of it, you know? So, but I mean, they, it's a hard thing because it's really giving up something that's nostalgic for our past and for a, a home or what once was, you know, what we can always go back and, and, and curl up around our memories is the idea. Right. Um, so it's a super psychological thing. Like I remember my friend Patrick and I tell this quick story. I think some people might've heard it before, but he talked about, he had, he had houses and lands and businesses in, in Vancouver. Hmm. And one day he's, you know, he said, is this, you know, is this all there is to it? And he decided to give it all up. And so he sold all his possessions or, or, or rid himself of all his possessions. Quick story. And he reduced himself down to a backpack, hundred percent, everything down to a backpack. And he, and he head out off to Europe. So I'm just going to backpack across Europe and find my, myself. Right. So he wandered around for a year with only this backpack. But he said, when I got rid of all my possessions, I had this twinge of my stuff, my stuff, my stuff. And it just like, it was, it was heartbreaking and, and it was super hard to do. And then as soon as it was done and I only had a backpack, I was okay. So I'm wandering around Europe with a backpack. And he said, I ended up in, uh, um, uh, Myanmar. And there was, and I, uh, yeah. that's not in Europe. <laughs> well, I know, but he was, he's wandering and he got a long he, way. Huh? A, a year he was wandering and he said, uh, wow. there was a, in, in Burma, Burma, yeah. Right? Yeah. Burma. Yeah. And, and there was this Burmese monk that he met on a, on a trail and he started talking to this guy and the Burmese monk says, well, why don't you become a monk if you're trying to find me? What? I'm not religious. He goes, well, you don't yeah. have to be religious. So he said, why not? So, and he says, you can be a monk for a few days or a week or a couple, you know, really? So he took his, you know, he hired himself to this monastery the next day. And he said, I would like to try this and be a monk. And he said, the first thing they did was they took away his backpack. Okay. You know, surrender this. And he said, I had the same existential angst as when I gave my positions up, my, my houses and cars and boats and stuff like that. And I was like that, but that's my, my stuff, my backpack, which was close to his heart. And they gave him yeah. an orange robe and a wooden bowl, you know, that's all he had. And he said that the orange bowl, the, the orange robe kept falling open and, you know, his, his <laughs> junk hanging out and stuff. He couldn't figure out how to wrap it properly, but he finally figured it out. And every day the monks, including him, would go to yeah. the village with their wooden bowl and the people would put rice and beans into it and they would come back, you know, that was their alms and whatever. They'd come back. And then they, as someone would cook it all and they would have a communal meal. And he did this for yeah. days and days and days. And after about three months, they had this ceremony because another visiting uh, um, monk was coming who was some kind of a grand, uh, grand uh, monk. <laughs> and so they had a different routine that day. And, and everybody was kind of like buzzing with the excitement of this new routine. And they go into this big communal room. And off to the side was a room where everybody went in and, and put, set down their bowl, their wooden bowl for the day. And then they went into this communal room and they had this big ceremony, this big, you know, festival type thing, a different thing. At the end of the day, they went into the room to get the bowls. And he was like, he walked into the room. He said, I walked in there. And he said, I went in to get my bowl, obviously, right? And he says, I looked this way, I looked this way. And as all I could see, as far as you could see, was stacks of wooden bowls. He says, my first thought was, which one's mine? <laughs> which is my bowl? He said, I had the same, same existential, like, you know, a fear of loss. With my his, his, All my, his last thing of attachment in the world, right? Which is, where's, his, where's my bowl? <laughs> and he said, I, something clicked in me that day. And he, and he said, you know, and he said, he came back to Vancouver. He owned houses and lands and businesses again. Very successful man. Good friend. Yeah. And he said, you know what, in, in the difference now is I own my possessions. They no longer own me. Yeah. It's something just, you know, slewed off him. Some, something drained off of his, up of his energy, you know, incredible. That's an extreme so, story, an extreme transformation. Right. Yeah. To go from, from the massive material success that he had. Right? I mean, my is 
kind of at the end of the track you know it's <laughs> difficult to access to be a monk i like hearing that um i think that experience of walking around with a bowl i haven't done that i've had a few spiritual explorations but not that walking around with a bowl and that's my only possession to go from house to house you got to that's going to prove to you that you can trust life when you actually rid yourself of all money, all belongings, all capacity to actually make money, and you don't do anything productive. You're just sitting there and meditating and contemplating, right? The fact that you can knock on a door and get enough to eat, and then you can go and sleep somewhere, and it's, um, you know, you're not going to get killed by a local tiger or something like that. It's got to be the ultimate imprint. Well, it's a trust. Right? Like, oh, yeah, life yeah. is actually going to provide. Yeah. So, you know, like I've always had this notion, like people say, well, I'm trying to save up money before I go and follow my dream. I have to save yeah. a bunch of money and I have to take care of this. I have to take care of that. But I'm telling you, I had this notion back in the early days of enlightened seduction before I met you and before, you know, it evolved into Ars Amrata of we've had no money at all, but we would <coughs> go to Amsterdam or something with a one-way tick, one ticket and no idea how we're going to get out of there. You've done this many times in your life, Jordan. You, you should, you know, do a video series or, or write a book or blog about your experiences because they're more, they're more hairy than mine are, you know, and more to the wire than mine ever were. Um, but, you would, but you had this notion of trusting it. And, you know, and, and I, my influence is Casanova. He went from city to city from, and from fortune to being run out of the city to yeah. another fortune to being run out of a city to, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and, and he would have to, he'd go to Moscow in the winter, for instance, in a carriage pulled by horses with the, you know, the fur blanket on him for days. You know, we just go, we fly there, we fly, we whip around. So it was a real burden to travel. And he would take his trunk of letters, which he kept with him all his life, his, his trunk of, you know, letters of, from the women. And, but he always trusted and he would have no money and, and he'd drive in a city and he'd say, you know, I heard about this one guy and I'm trying to get an introduction to him and try and become, you know, and he would, and he wrote about this and it really influenced me because he trusted to the wind. He said, you know, like, he, you know, he trusted life to the, the river of life, you know, and, and that somehow incorporated into me where you just, I, I, I had the saying back then, you know, like, um, success is going to have to show up and money is going to have to show up because we're going anyway. Yeah. We don't have time to wait for money. We're going to go and the money's going to have to show up because we're going. And yeah. you know, when you trusted it, that, that you, your, your bread and water will be sure. And you know, like Elijah, the ravens will come, you know, and feed you, you know, if you're, if you're on a, you're doing some kind of divine <laughs> work, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. You can trust that the rice is going to get put in your bowl like a monk and it always does. Yes, it always, always does. does. Yeah. It, 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 you never, you know, like uh, your foot always hits something if you step into the void, always, you know? I think it was Morgan Freeman that said, you know, when I was a young man and I was trying to be an actor and I sucked at it so bad and I couldn't get work, you know, we, he's revered as an actor. And he said, I was going to quit and become a cab driver. And he said, but you know what I discovered in life, if you are at the edge of what's possible and you can't continue forward and you put your foot one step further into the void, into the blackness in front of you, he said, your foot will always hit something. You know, it always will hit something if you trust and, 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 and say, I've got to figure this out. I'm going to go forward, which is a, a leap of faith. It's Kierkegaard's leap of faith. You know, it's like, you have to trust in that it's going to be okay because you have no surety of it at all. Yeah. And he said, your foot will always hit something. And he said this incredible concept. He said, what I discovered at the edge of when you couldn't go further, someone will arrive into your life and give you the next step. Not something. Some person will arrive at the edge end of your rope and some person will come along and, and, be, and, and give you that guidance to the next step, some personal yeah. life. And it's completely, yeah. absolutely, I, it's 100% true. I traveled for years doing, you know, a little bit of coaching, but m mainly lazy 
and trying, you know, <laughs> looking, you know, trying to write my book and stuff like that with no money. We never had yeah. any money, but we lo- but we loved it, and we we had a we had a real belief in you know the leaf on the on on you going down the river, and it's the, yeah. you know, that that's the concept of using delight. I I steal all that from Casa, uh from Casanova, you know. It, it's totally mythological, you know. You you come to the end of your tether, and then the the mentor or the muse or the band band of brothers, the the tribe comes. Yeah. Along and journey always, but. always, Jordan. It you, it never fails if you are, you know, chance favors the prepared mind, right? And you know, luck favors the lucky. If you are in a in a contemplative mode of 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 wondering about your future and the curiosity of your future, and you are moving forward with intent, even if you don't know what that intent is toward. I don't know where I'm going. What's going to happen with me next? But I have this this leap of faith, this belief in this then it will happen. If you're just listless and you're sitting around scratching your, 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 scratching your hiney and, and, and watching YouTube all day and, and you know, uh, of course it's not going to, you know, you've got to be proactively designing your life in some way. We talk about that in our, in our essentials course, right? This is the first week. The first week, the first theme of the 90-day course is designing your life, making your life yeah you know, live, creating your life as a work of art. You're painting your life. I want to have an artisanal, artisanal, I don't know how you say that word, uh, approach to living. And I want to have an artistic life. I want to look back and say that was a, a work of art. And there's a couple like, you know, mis, you know, blobs of paint that stuck out of there that didn't quite fit. But overall, it makes this impressionistic painting, the impression of my life. I want to explore a little bit the notion of wandering because what, what we're talking about is right at the essence of the Azamarata message, right? Like there is, um, I think every man, well, no, this doesn't happen to every man, not at all by any stretch of the imagination, but, but we come to a period or a moment in our lives where certain things have been taken care of. So it might be, oh yeah, I've finished my kind of teenage years and I graduated school. I made out with a few girls. Um, I know where I'm going. I know a bit who I am. And now I want to take off with a backpack. I'm 19 years old. I'm going to hitchhike to the other end of the world. Like, goodbye, right? And those, the younger you are, cliche, the younger you are, the easier it is to go wandering because the younger you are, the easier it is to bungle yourself, or, you know, in, in the back of somebody's car or sleeping on. I, the, the amount of times I was traveling and either hitchhiked or picked up a ride and then they asked me where have you got to stay tonight and I said I don't know and then they offered me where you can stay with us and then they took me out and we we had a dinner or something like that so I ended up hitchhiking and getting a a free spot to sleep the amount of times that happened was was phenomenal but that's it's kind of easy to do when you're 19 21 23 because you don't need as much sleep and your um your kind of sensible head is not caught up with you yet there's so many risks I took on the back of the adrenaline and the testosterone of being 21 that I would probably not take (laughs) nowadays, right? So so it's it's kind of easy to go wandering as a young man, but you you can get to the age of 40, 50, 60, and we obviously work with men like this all the time. They're like, okay, my my wandering phase is arriving. Like I realized that I grew well into adulthood and I got all my affairs in a row. You know, I took care of who I needed to be as a career. And now I realized that, if I want to actually be my authentic self, I need to get the hell out of here and go on this wandering phase. And it, I'm no sticking question. with the word wandering because there's a real quality of, um, it's not a, uh, th- these can be really confused, right? There, there's this kind of exodus mode of like, ah, fuck it. I just don't like real life. I'm, I'm fucking off to Thailand where... I'm going to smoke weed on the beach and get a girl that doesn't bother me too much. And I'm just going to numb out and look at the ocean for the rest of my days. Right. And, or I'm going to go to wherever and just, just get obliterated until my bank account runs out and I have to go home and do it again. There's there's this kind of running away failure from society. I'm going to, yeah. yeah, Escapism. I, I kind of failed in this society. I'm going to go somewhere where it's easy and I don't want anyone to bother me. Like that's one attitude of, of, Travelers, you see on the road, pirates, you see on the road. I met a lot of pirates like this in, in Asia, <laughs> in South America. And I was like to a large extent. That. Like, I was to a large extent that. I want to go where the, where, the, where the living's cheap and the girls are cute and easy and don't give me a, a rough time, you know? Yeah. Um, 
But on the other end, and, and it's very different, this energy of wandering, which is I need to know the mysteries. I actually want to get, I, we went to a church. I think it, I think it was in Spain. Um, one of these massive Catholic cathedrals, you know, the biggest one in the city. And we went inside and we, no, it might've even been the Vatican. Yeah. We went to the Vatican, Adelia and I, oh, and we okay, sat yeah. there in, um, St. Peter's Basilica, mm -hmm. just looking at, just looking at paintings on the walls and the ceilings and the domes and soaking up the energy of this place where people have been praying for 1500 years. And yeah. they had three words on the ceiling. And I looked up at these words and it was, uh, humildad, humility, um, obediencia, obedience, and pobreza, poverty. Wow. That's not Latin, but those were the three words that I understood. And I'm looking up and I'm translating these words. Okay, so there's three words that dominate the skyline of this cathedral. Um, obedience, humility, and poverty. Poverty, wow. So I contemplate that for a little while. And, and the <laughs> first thing that comes to mind is my uh, political cynic part of me that's like, oh, it's very... Um, it's very convenient to expose obedience and humility and poverty on the masses. So then you can just take all their money as, <laughs> you know, fun, siphon it off into the church where all the priests are drinking yeah. the finest wine and coating everything with gold and velvet and sitting on their kind of thrones with their crowns on their heads. Um, so I'm, I'm angry and I'm like, this is why Catholicism's bad and ride on Henry VIII. And it's good that we moved to this modernist time to look what religion was doing to these people for a thousand years and the enslavement of Latin America, that the Catholic church, just nasty, cynical political thinking. Right. And I sit on it a little bit more and wonder, um, you know, might there be a, a golden shadow? Like why suspect the dark shadow of the church? Might there be a golden, um, missed signal in those words? And humility is quite simple, right? Like mm -hmm. I, th I think we can align on why humility is a good quality to ponder upon and deepen and, and, and embody in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Obedience is a bit tougher. Mm -hmm. Especially for us rebel feeling, you know, <laughs> we're against the man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 and roll. <laughs> but something flipped for me and it, I, I mean, I stopped believing in, in Jesus and God when I was about seven, you know, after I found out that it wasn't a Santa Claus, it was actually my mum and dad that would sneak presents into a sack and tell you me were it was disillusioned. Just, Boom. I mean, totally. <laughs> How can the, and the Easter bunny, why would he like chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> There's no biological sense in that. Um, but, but it's funny to revisit some of the fundamentals of religion as, a, a, as an adult, you know, after you've seen and felt some things in life. And this notion of obedience, when I realized, oh, yeah, it's not obedience to the Vatican or obedience to the, the, the priest or the pastor who I projected was trying yeah. to run my life with, with morality. And then I would rebel from him and his values all these years. Actually, it's obedience to God. Yeah. Which is yeah. what? What's the truth? What's the divine truth that, that is living as a tiny little unseen kernel within yourself, within your yeah. heart, the, the way that you know that you have to go? Are you going to obey the, the silent, un, unheard longing of your own heart and actually follow your truth? Or are you going right. to ignore the, the kind of rumble when you wake up at five in the morning or whatever? Hmm, I'd rather be in uh, Kazakhstan on a mountaintop or in Colombia in a hot tub surrounded by girls than I would be going to my, you know, my nine to five, it's, it's listening to that whisper of you call to adventure. That, that's what yeah. I see as obedience. Yeah. Um, and then I think poverty is the most interesting one. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've been meditating a lot on poverty, right? Like what, watching the news, tying it back in with the virus, the, the first thing, the first big fear, I said this to you before, the first big fear I had about the virus was that, oh yeah, my elderly family are going to get it and they're going to die and I won't see them again. Mm -hmm. I remember that. So my practice is, yeah, if I'm so afraid of that, I'm just going to pick up the phone and say like, okay, what if you get the virus? Are you scared? I'm scared. Let's have a conversation about your death and the light and the possibility that I might never see you again. Like, let's just hash it all out. And it, it, it's a brutal facing of, our, of definitely some of my deepest fears. I don't want to lose my elderly you know, my mother and my aunt, my uncle, my older family. 
I don't want to lose them. So to sit in that is transformative, actually, to have a conversation like that with, with one's family. And then the second thing that I became afraid of was the economy. Like, what happens if we have a 1929 to 1933 Great Depression and say, um, I feel like I'm sitting pretty because, you know, our work is not affected so far. We're able to live in these beautiful places. My lockdown is not bad at all. Um, but what if all of the people that we work with, their, their, their funds dry up? Or what if their dollars are not worth anything anymore? Or what if, you know, the government confiscates everyone's money and doesn't allow anyone to hoard gold and all of the scary stories that are being woven at the moment? And, and to sit in the garden and contemplate poverty? And, and I, just to let the viewers know, like, like I, I do this. There's a lot of different things you can meditate upon, but I will sit outside and be like, okay, for the next half an hour, I'm going to bring up images of my mind of literally having very little to eat, going down to the Banja, which is the mm -hmm. local village um, community, with my bowl and being like, we've got no income, the, AT the ATM is bust, the dollar's not worth anything anymore, we've got a bowl, um, give us some rice because mm. the community's coming together to, to cook yeah. and take care of each other in a much more kind of almost Neolithic old school way. <laughs> um, system. yeah. And, and I sit there and think like, wow, they've taken away everything from me. This is ultimate poverty. Um, and then a part of me kicks in and says, actually, I'm not a hundred percent afraid of that situation because I've lived it before. Yeah. Part of my, part of my wandering and going to Spain was, Oh yeah, there were nights where I just had rice and beans. And then if I had an onion, it was like a hallelujah moment. Seriously, I would cook the dinner with the onion and, and what an onion can do to your food if you're just having rice and beans is quite extraordinary. There's so <laughs> much great. going on in an onion. Um, like all of us, like with a memory like that, and the, the kind of hitchhikers and the wanderers that have had that kind of far out phase will know what I'm talking about here, that there's a real ecstasy in poverty, which is the minimal life, which is that I, I had everything, but I gave up even the backpack from my back. I gave it up and I sat there and it's like, I've got absolutely nothing right now. And, yeah. and, and something opens up and, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, you know, if they take everything away, even, even like my computer doesn't work anymore because I can't buy any chargers and the battery's broken and, it, it's literally we're we're back to the stone age kind of mm -hmm. disaster scenario i'm like well at least i can write like yeah yeah the, the simplicity of that yeah the fundamental gifts that i want to give as a purpose or as a legacy writing sitting down with a group telling stories offering some kind of um contemplation or consolation or vision of something that could be more excited telling stories to the next generation in the tribe mm -hmm. like all of these which i think are close to my purpose close to your purpose close to many who are in our work like they don't get stripped away like no those fundamental fulfillment elements are the because you've because jordan you because you you've you set out to to have those as your end goal, you know, the journey, your end goal, not the journey to riches and fame. And the, the journey is the fundamental principles that are, that, are, that are near and dear to your heart are at the base of, of human existence and longing. And so those don't go away. Like you said, you know, like once we have shelter, you know, Maslow and all this kind of stuff, once we have shelter and food and water, now we start to look around for community and communion and, you know, these various things and your whole life has been predicated, has been, has been designed around going and finding your own missions, your own adventures so that you can take that in your hands and both hands and hand it to someone else. You know, it's that it's, you created a life of that and not, n not everybody has that. Not everybody's going to have a life like that or, or desires a life like that, but you're in. So you could say that you've designed your life to serve, but not to serve in a subservient way. Do you know what I mean? Or like in some kind a, of missionary way. Or like altruistic, let's, let's do altruistic, I'm this do-gooder, I'm, so, I'm unselfish and I will, and I'm yeah. going to, and I have a real, you know, burden for my fellow man. No, you're, 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 you're an adventurer. You're a, a, a mystic. You, you want to understand the, the mysteries of life. And because you, they're so exciting to you, you want to 
share it with others. That's all it is. It's not because you have this altruistic streak or, or you're setting out to be this didactic personality or, or to go and preach to the masses, you know? This, the people who, who set themselves up is like, I've got something to teach you, you know, holding their finger and going like this. And, and the, the, the modern gurus of the world, you know? We're not that, we're not gurus. We just really believe in life. We believe in women. We believe in a, 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 the beautiful existence of life. We want to share it with others, what we've seen. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, would say, I would say, you know, you say I'm, I'm not, like a, not like everyone else or many people like that out there, but I would say that if, if you're kind of listening to this or watching this and you're, you've made it through enough of uh, meandering conversation to still be <laughs> tuned into this, you're, you're probably made of a similar stuff. So I'm, yeah, I'm our audience of, is I'm, yeah I'm I'm assuming I'm predicting that it is is us. If, if is. you're a man of if you're a man of purpose, and this is another one of those kind of myths that a lot of people have in their mind. I need to have a lot of money saved up so that I can go traveling, or I need to have a lot of money saved up so that I can do my purpose or my work that my art yeah. that I know in my heart to be true. Then I then I'm just going to work like a um, I'm just going to work on something inauthentic until I've got enough you know, maybe a six figure wedge behind me and then I'm going to go and do my thing. Right. And yeah, it's very illusory because if you've got a strong enough vision, you, the, the money can show up. There's always going to be some entrepreneurial investor kind that, that can fund you or patron yeah. you if, if you're really committed to your, your work. But what I want to say is that as, as you get closer to your purpose, you realize that, that, what the energy of that purpose is, is not something that needs money really to fund it. No, like, not at all. Men, men have had comes. purpose for, for thousands of years. And, yeah. and we, we've been having this book club, right? So I'm, I'm reading people like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and thinking, wow, you know, like these guys sat and, and their amazing legacy that they gave to the world is, is in their writings and the culmination of their thought. And they, they recorded it and it survived 2,000 years or this, that, that epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah. book that we read yeah um people saved those tales they wrote them on stones and well it was oral first it was like handed down yeah you know? yeah marcus aurelius is a good example because he didn't write something for you to to read in the future he wrote it that was his thoughts that he wanted to retain for himself and you know from this from this emperor we have this handed down to us but he was really trying to keep his thoughts gathered and it was his own personal notes and, you know, and, and he didn't set out to be this, this stoic teacher, you know, yeah. just, it's just, we, we, we relate to his authenticity in his work and say, I can, I, that in my modern age, that I can relate to that. And it applies to my life and I can apply that to my life and I can see the lessons that, that are timeless, timeless lessons, you know, and, and the needs of humanity is, I, I I said recently, was it on the last call? I can't remember that, you know, there's nothing new under the sun in Ecclesiastes, you know, nothing. We think, especially in this, in this time of trouble that we're in, this coronavirus time, we think, wow, we're going through something that the world has never seen before, unprecedented. But how many plagues destroyed? You yeah. know, every 50 years a plague comes through and destroys a, a chunk of the population. And how many quarantines have there been in the past where people hid? And how many times in the past have people put on masks and the long ones with the, with the, uh, the dust in it? And how many, you know, how many pestilences and plagues have we run from and hidden from and killed off a chunk of people? And we think, oh, we're special. You know, this is why I have a lot of optimism because uh, there, there's a lot of parallels between this, you know, flu and the Spanish flu that mm -hmm. devastated Europe. It yeah. devastated Europe. That's not even compared to the bubonic plague and some of these other things that, that were super devastating, you know? And so, so imagine our science and our, and our modern medical uh, knowledge is, is so advanced that, you know, the impact is minimal and, and compared to, for instance, the Spanish flu, right? And we think that we're special, but you know, our parents and grandparents and great grandparents and you know, all our cultures went through real serious things like this. And they got on with, you know, building cities and creating life and having a laugh with their loved one in a park, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about perspectives 
before I go there, just to sum up, the word for me is to become, or the phrase for me is to become intimate with poverty. Like if you are coming yeah. from a, a, a rich, modern Western society and you're scared shitless about the notion of poverty, which is scary. Like it, it's scary to be in it for a lot of years. It's scary to see it or to live amongst it mm. in parts of the world where I've you know, lived among that kind of day-to-day -day reality. Um, but to really become intimate with what that means for you, because there, there can be moments of absolute ecstasy or revelation or self-discovery in, in poverty. And it's yeah. only, only once I shed myself of my material attachments, could I know what it's like to go door to door with a bowl and learn how to trust that life's always got my back, that even if I've got nothing, uh, I've still got me. And as long as I'm not poor, they say poverty exists only in the mind. As long as I've not got a mental poverty, I've got my mm -hmm. contemplation and my powerful questions, my, my curiosity, uh, I'm never going to be poor. And we're resourceful. You know, and we're, we're, the, the people that are, that are listening to this and who are drawn to our work, who's, who, who, you know, sat through all 50 episodes, 50 half hour episodes of our In Search of the Alabaster Girl series we did. And there's a lot of people who said, I watched it a couple of times. You know, I, I sat through that a couple of times. And so anybody who's, who's drawn to this and who's this far into the video of you and me blathering, right, is a different kind of entity it's a, different, it's a different person right if you, and, and so yeah, like, the congratulations if you've got enough attention span to make it this, this far, far. On the podcast like you're good for life you've got you're you one of us <laughs> get through poor moments so we're um, so only certain people or certain type of people will be drawn to what we're doing you know which is this this um, this you know the archetypes that we always talk about you know like um there's a certain tone of person and somebody who is trying to understand something and so they are the kind of person that will sit in contemplation it's maybe in a cathedral you know and sit and wonder about the 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 the, the stored silence the stored prayers that have gone up for centuries in that building you know births and baptisms and and deaths and marriages and you know and it's it's a stored element and you could feel it <coughs> so they're drawn to it the same as we would be drawn to it so the reverence you can have sitting in a cathedral and looking up to the ceilings, at, you know, which is identical to the reverence you can have looking at the mountains and, you know, and, and the mist coming over the mountains. It's like there's a sense of the sublime and, and awe. And so they're drawn to this kind of conversation. So, mm. so it's a natural extension for them to sit in contemplation of these, of austerity, you know? Yeah. I don't know if poverty is the right word. Hmm. Because poverty has a connotation that it's you, you've been externally, circumstantially stripped of, and now you're stuck in, you know, in, it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like something happened to you as opposed or, or, to, as opposed to renunciation. Kind of, yeah. Or it's kind of, you, you were born into poverty. You, you grew up in poverty. Um, you never had a chance to get out of the kind of mental or cultural poverty that you're into and you're doomed uh -huh, to live yeah. that lifestyle. So it's kind of like a victimized people. A that mental victimization. Yeah. Philanthropists from the West and so on, like that kind of view of poverty. But there's the, no, I was rich for a period and something befell me. Economic yes. collapse. Yeah. Um, you know, bank, bank account was seized, whatever it was, lost my job, wife left. And so okay, on. yeah. So yeah, um, exactly that. And, and, and you might live in poverty for a while, but then there is the possibility that you know that could swing back because you are a man of or a woman of education, free thinking, and you understand how people and life works enough that you can you can you, you trust that at some point something you will trust, happen about yeah. it. even if you have to live in a Burmese monastery for nine years, yeah, and then so it kicks in again. I I think I said this before, but. We, we were in Taiwan and we went to this museum of ancient Chinese art and there was this big thing of the, the kings and the courts and the, the elites. They would mm -hmm. gather and have these um, great feasts or great gatherings and it would be a bit like our conference where they would sit there with the best, okay, this is the best painter and this is the best calligrapher <laughs> and this is the best poet and this is the the most um, ornate tea ceremony person, and they would all enjoy the cultivation of, of the gifts of the tribe. 
or the gifts of the collective. And then uh, when that was over, they would have to go off and, and cultivate their gifts once more. Oh, shit, like the Emirati conference is over. Yeah. yeah, I sucked. The other guy was good. I'm going to come back next year with a speech <laughs> and how everyone's and, you know, I've got to work on my craft so I can show up at the next epic gathering with, with something to show for it. And they said that a lot of the poets, what they would do is trek right out to the edges of known civilization like they, they would go in poverty it was funny because all the artwork and this is from the third to the fifth century a.d all of the artwork would depict these noblemen poets going out into the snow like to the feet of the himalayas or the jungle or up to the plains of mongolia um they would all be going up and they would be sitting on that knife edge of poverty like this is the edge of existence and they would be longing for poverty how, how can I sit in this energy of having nothing? And they would have a camel and a couple of slaves basically carrying all their stuff. So there's <laughs> no real, you know, their, their back is covered basically. But they would sit and wonder like, well, wow, here I am and it's cold and I'm suffering and I'm going to bed on a hard bed. I've not got my wife with me. I've not got the comforts at home. And they would sit in that. And it was only in that encounter with the extreme that they would have enough of a an opening, let's say, like a, a concept with something transcendent that could inform their poetry with something new. Mm. Almost as if no good poetry ever came from luxury. It only came from the desolation that lies at the end of civilization. And they would have to go all the way out there just so that they could capture something of the gods. Can I steal a little bit about, can I steal something from the nature and the transcendent and the unknown, which lies so far away so that when I go back to my yeah. conference next year, I've actually got a story to tell. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, and it's a, I mean, there's, there's, there's the, there's a contemplation about that or a conversation about that. It's been going on for a long time, you know, like the, the romantic poets, the Byrons and the Shelleys of the world, you know, they, they didn't go to the edge. They might've done a little tour around Italy and stuff like that, but they didn't go to the edge of the wilderness or the edge of, but they did, internally by you know taking opium and stuff like that and, and, and desolating themselves so that they could <coughs> on purpose so that they could you know create this kind of art and it's the same thing as you know any of the rock and roll musicians that feel that they can't write music unless they're you know high or you know slammed on on alcohol so interesting um yeah what there, there's something that, you know, state so that they can have that that receive that information from the gods they have to, yes. enter, into mythical you have to enter into some kind of altered state. And it could be like the deprivation of the wilderness, like you said, like in the snowy Himalayas, just, you yeah. know, Himalayas, right? It's interesting. And there's something to it. I mean, like, um, there's a great debate, you know, like, does art come from, does great art only come from suffering? Or is it, uh, is it just like, you look like Mozart, you know, one of the greatest artists of, 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 of our Western canon, uh, he was frivolous and you know writing fart <laughs> jokes and and <laughs> obsessed with uh, you know you know uh, scatological humor in all of his letters and all, in some of his operas and some of his you know music. It's like it's like talking about you know like uh, some pretty dirty stuff. And it was like he, with his whole family, and he grew right. up with that. He had his whole whole thing, and so and he had a pretty you know relaxed life. You know, but he created some of the most, and, and, and that's what, you know, scholars are, you can't put it together that he was so juvenile in his humor and such a, you know, and, and so crude. And he created some of the most mellifluous and, 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 and divine art that, you know, that we know in the West. Mm -hmm. So perhaps uh, we could say it like this. Um, great art doesn't have to come from suffering. But poverty and suffering <laughs> in the way of your great art. Say it again. Poverty and suffering what? But poverty and suffering doesn't necessarily hinder your great art. And it, yeah, and it may enhance it because you're in contemplative mode. If you're, if you're, you know, if, if you're reduced and, you, and, you're, and your frivolous pleasantries are taken away, like I, I can distract myself with the abundance of the internet and, I can, and, and the abundance of you know, uh, partying or whatever it is, because I have the comforts of life, because I don't, yeah. I'm not in a, in a, you know, straight situation. Um, there's something in you that doesn't do any kind of introspection. 
right? And you do introspection. If you're sitting, you know, uh, and you're cold at the bottom of the Himalayas, you're, you're wondering, you know, number one, yeah. what did I do this for? Yeah. You know, number it, two, it, how do I get out of it? <laughs> number three, how long will it be? Number four, why didn't I stay with that woman in the last, you know, in the last <laughs> hostel, in the last town that I met? This is certainly my vision for the, uh, the conferences and the conversations we have in Aza Murata is about this. Like when I go and yeah. sit and I watch a few speakers who are all members of our community that have grown through our conversation, that have become men of adventure and character, I want to hear their stories about when they went to the edge of civilization and touched into the, the transcendent and, yeah. and the poverty and the extreme and the, they tested their limits against the elements and they came back and I want to hear that fire that they then bring back to the tribe. That, that's my vision. I don't want to sit there and hear another lecture about the dance of the masculine and the feminine. Yeah. Um, yeah. It comes because it comes from where else, you know, the, the difference between, you know, my take on, on art and kitsch, you know, kitsch is the, you know, the, the, the fake sense of art, you know, like what is kitschy? Is like, you know, art has been, is something that is given to you from the transcendent, from the divine, is something that's handed to you, which you turn around and, and share. Like all the artists, every artist says, I don't know where it came from. You know, even the, the first line of, of the Iliad is, is speak through me, O muse, because I have nothing to say. You know, Homer's, hmm. that's the first line. I've got nothing. That's Muse, brilliant. Speak through me. I've got nothing to say. Yeah, the very first line. Yeah. And, and all artists since Homer have been saying that it comes, uh, it's, so it comes from something else that doesn't belong to you. And you take that art, whether it's painting or writing or poetry or whatever, and you hand it down. And kitsch is a gift that you're given to others that you didn't receive. That you didn't receive. You didn't receive it. It's just something, the outpouring of you. Look at me, here's what I did. As opposed uh, okay. to taking something from contemplation, from, yeah. from, from, an, from an artistic uh, you know, introspection, from, from contemplating the, the mountains and the sea and, and, and the girl you love and writing or painting about that. And now you take that, your own internal journey, a spiritual journey, captured in an artistic way and handed. And kitsch is just you just handing something. And look, I'm an artist and I'm painted this and I did this and that's kitsch. Yeah, I, I, I feel I, I it the last conference I went to, I had this great idea. So I'm going to tell you all my great idea now. That, that I just took from. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And that's why yeah. modern art is all about the artist. Look at me, look what I did and look at who I, you know, look at how I can shock you as opposed to, I have something that, that I have, I have glimpsed, I've seen something, I've, I've, I've caught a glimpse of something that in my unique way, I, I, I've shaped it and handing it and it's passed through you. That's Homer's, Homer's words are passed through him from the mm. muse, you know, like, and, and all the, the great artists recognize that. And the kitschy ones are saying, I'm great. And look what I did. And here's my music. And here's my. Yeah. A few things are getting tied together in my mind at the moment. Like I'm thinking about some of the, some of the men and women and the corners of our gatherings. They're like, oh, I'd, I'd like to say something, but I've got nothing to give. Or who am I? Like, I don't have an adventure to speak yet into this, into yeah. this space. Our gatherings are incredible that way, Jordan, because everything that we do, and it's evolved or, or, or shifted towards this more and more over the years, that it's all about the journey. And it's all about the personal journey, the quote unquote hero's journey of that individual, you know, uh, man that comes to our conferences. We had to cancel this one because of this coronavirus, but, you know, next fall, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll be back in, in the saddle. But those conferences are circulating around the conversation of the journey and the story of the journey for each of, the, of, of them. And as opposed to, you know, like, let's have this men's group of excellence. You know, like, let's, let's strive towards excellence. What, you know, what does that mean? Let's, let's tell our story and let's live a life that becomes a story with chapters and verse, you know? Yeah, yeah. And characters. Yeah. So, so the, the, the man or woman who's quiet on the, on the fringes, it's like, go and live your story. Like we invite you to go to the edge of what is yeah. civilization for you. Like surf on the, on the edge of the unknown of the wildness, see what you get, like open yourself up to these very, um, like 
spaces of poverty or spaces of extreme and, and see what comes through you from the muse. Ask. I've got nothing to say at this conference. I've got nothing to say to women. I've got nothing to say. Yeah. Ask, ask the yeah. muse, what, what is your life's journey to come through you? And, go out and, and you can feel the difference. To bring back. You can feel the difference when you're in a group and somebody speaks up and their whole purpose and intent of speaking is to teach a lesson to the group or to coach the group. You know, like, and it, and it falls flat and it, and it, you know, it, it rings hollow in you your ear. You want to know how to be real, man? I'm going to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> this is how you do it. And, and, and I'm thinking, what's your story that you have? Tell, tell that in the context of a story. You know, like, this is how I've learned something in my life that made me realize, you know, what it means to be a real man. Now it got my attention in my ear as opposed to just trying to be this, 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 um, uh, a coach, I guess you could say, which, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't denigrate that phrase, but, but it's like, we're story driven and it's all story and all that we do, all I've ever done all these years is tell stories that I think are fun and cool. And same with you, hmm. you know, and, and I want to hear stories. And so I will sit and listen in that group to somebody's story and, and the lesson they learned, the girl they loved and lost. I listen to these stories. This is, you know, this is the arc of all stories are, you know, there's this protagonist and the protagonist, you know, runs into trouble and all stories have to have some kind of, you know, crisis in it. And then he surmounted the trouble of the crisis by this and, you know, and the antagonist. And so, um, if we're not, if we're not telling stories, if we're not gathering together to tell stories and to listen to stories and to foster again, the art of storytelling, then we're just a bunch of, talking heads that, you know, what's the point? By the way, I'm drinking a, a drink in a, a green coal. I only have these in Romania and it's stevia. Okay. There's no sugar, no aspartame. It's the stevia. So is it Coca-Cola? Uh, it looks oh, like Coca-Cola, but it's a, it's a company that really much copied their design. I think it's a, a Bulgarian company or something, but it's good and it tastes like real Coca-Cola, but it's got stevia. So, Just a shout out for Green Cola, the sponsors of today's oh, yeah. episode. I'm not supposed to do that, am I? <laughs> find, find the promotional link, type Zan and get a 50% discount for a great <laughs> Green Cola wherever you're living in the world. Um, what, one, one topic I really wanted to cover today was um, the, the uh, breadth of perspective from which we look at things. So I'll explain okay. that a little bit. Um, if I... And this is watching my own kind of mind and attention over the last month, right? We're in this very unknown phase of history. Um, how's things going to look afterwards? What's the economy going to be? What's, what's going to happen? Nobody knows. So we look for information, right? And I turn on YouTube. And as I said, it's quite clickbait. Everything's clickbait. I think we right. should call the name of this episode, Everything is Going to Be All Right have a big picture of the world and a smiley face. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that. Just so like the clickbait energy of yeah. if this pops up on someone's feed in YouTube, the clickbait energy of it is good. Um, but it, it's, it's like all these charts, the economy going down and then, oh, here comes Bitcoin and Bitcoin's going up to the moon. And then here comes this. And it's, and it's all this, like the, the closer one's noses to the wire of what's happening on an hour to hour basis. If, if you're, I'm, I'm studying economy the last few weeks because I'm, I'm getting a lot out of it. Mm. Um, and I've never studied economy. You know, I had my 2008 pinch, which shocked the life into me and had me make some big decisions about the ownership of my life and how I was going to lead that. Um, but the economy, I never looked at it because I, I wanted to consider the more artistic, spiritual, right. personal, psychological questions and the, the mysteries of life, let's say in women, beauty. But the, the economy is fascinating. And, and if I try and study it, I've got kind of three different uh, depths of study. Like the first one is, did Bitcoin go up today? Or <laughs> like what happened to the stock market going down? And what happened to the, the oil barrow, barrels that went to minus $40 and the war on Russia and the Saudis? Like I can get encapsulated in the day-to-day -day whirling milestream of events, right? International monetary things, yeah. And, and it's a very horrible place to be because the more I invest my attention into the 
the extreme short term fluctuations of things, it, it just creates anxiety. Like, oh my God, did I miss that investment FOMO? Oh my God, is my stock portfolio going down? Like killer. And you can see just how tragic you get caught up into the emotional upswings and downswings. It's like women. Oh my God, she didn't text me back. Like, did I do something wrong? You're in the complete most short term um, emotional yeah. whirlwind of the day to day events when your nose is pressed so close to current affairs. And so you're I'm wondering what happened. Constantly. And I'm like, Jesus, if I'm a day trader or something, I'm going crazy because I have to literally, I can't stop looking at my screen because if I miss a deal or something, then I'm just going to die of the FOMO. So, so just having one's awareness that close up to the, to the current affairs is painful. And then there's a kind of second perspective, which is, okay, let's lean back a little bit and hear, yeah, let's hear from the political side. Let's hear from the economist's analysis. Let's hear what happened in the last 20 years and what can we learn from 2008 and why are we here now? And all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more intelligent. Like, okay, I'm not so worried about the mm -hmm. fluctuations of the fear. What's going to happen? Debt crisis, exclamation mark. Ah, okay, I've got a bit more measured and a bit more measurement and intelligence in this economic debate so I can start learning what is quantitative easing um, and what is an in, in, inflationary cycle and a deflationary cycle and which one comes first. And there's some calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you've got this, um, it's a much more intelligent um, conversation about the economy. Um, but it's also, I found it very uh, consuming, subsuming. The more I try to, to understand economy from the, I'm still quite close to what's going on, but I'm a little bit back. Um, that can take over my whole mental headspace. So did, did you like it? Like you seem to embrace it, like the, the, the I, I study mean, thereof. I, I'm getting a lot of all, all these three different uh, categories. I'm getting a lot, like even from the, yeah. like I open up my computer and Bitcoin went up a thousand dollars and I'm like, oh, I was going to buy some and I didn't. And the, like to, to, to learn what it's like to be, uh, your on the edge of, yeah. in on a thread of the day-to-day -day fluctuations. It, it's, it's a wild ride, right? Yeah. Um, and then you step back a little bit and it's like, okay, that brings a bit more measure. But then there's, and you hear the analysts and the hour-long videos about this and that and the other. And, it, and, and then I start to learn a little bit more of the intricacies and why is it a good time to invest in this because this is going to happen and so on. And you get to have more of a conversation. And then there's another step back. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where I'm completely fascinated. And there's only two people I know that are taking that third step back. Hmm. Um, one of them is you, actually. Mm -hmm. And another one is, is uh, a billionaire economist, kind of hedge fund owner called Ray Dalio. He's, oh, I just heard about that guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's in his 70s. Wrote a book um, called he, Principles. Yeah. I just He's heard about that enormous, yeah. enormous hedge fund. And so I've been reading his stuff and what sets him apart is that he takes on a historical perspective. So even the most kind of hmm. excellent intellectual um, complexity theory, I'm really into a lot of the complexity theory stuff that's going on and how these different systems are all intertwined and one pandemic over here creates economic chaos over here, which creates a kind of tribalism, racism problem over here, which has <laughs> potential problems for yeah. a drought yeah. that might happen over there. It's amazing, like yeah. the interconnectedness of all of this. Um, so you've got the complexity theorists and, and all that, and it's like a big tangled debate, like just to get your head around everything that's happening in the, in the day to day is extremely hard. It will fill up one's consciousness with thought. And yeah. then I see my girlfriend, Oh, babe, I've been thinking too much today. Sorry, I've got no, nothing to offer you. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to figure out what's happening with the world. Um, so th this last step back would be, we would call it, it, the nose is the furthest away from the current affairs. We could call this a, a historical perspective because it's, um, and in Ray, Ray Dalio's words, he says, yeah, it, even the best economists in the world are trying to figure out what's happening to the system. And they're trying to figure out what's happening to the system with information that they've got from within their lifetimes. And if you're 50 or 60 years old, you can say some really intelligent things about what might happen because you've seen a lot. So it's usually, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's usually the kind of 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 
yeah, a 20 year old doesn't really know an economic crash. He would have been eight in the last one. So he doesn't have that embodied memory. A 50 year old now has seen a few crashes and, and he can draw some dots and make some really intelligent analyses. Mm-hmm. So that's a different depth of the conversation. But Ray Dalio is talking about the economy goes in cycles, which are longer than a, a person's lifetime. So if you want to make sense of what's mm-hmm. actually happening in the world today, you have to study things that have never happened in my lifetime, but that have happened many times before. It's cyclic. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, it goes and there's, there's larger cycles, smaller cycles, and then the daily cycle, you know, and like you talked about, yeah. But most of, us are, most of us can start to see that there are cycles, but we're limited to only seeing cycles that have actually happened in our own lifetimes. That's right. Even if you're, so he's 70, um, yeah, you would have to be 91 years old. You'd have to be over 100 to have actual memory. You'd have to be 97, 98 years old now to actually remember the 1929 crisis and the depression that, that followed. So even if you're a 70 year old analyst, you're probably not going to remember some of the, the memories from that in a deep way. Mm-hmm. You'd have a cursory, oh, that was a history lesson I got once when I was in, in school, but, but it's not in my embodied living memory. So That's I won't right. consider it too deep. And so Dalio's analysis, which, which for me has been the most liberating view on economy is, okay, so I'm going to study the rise and fall of empires. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. What happened in, and he's studying something like 17 to 20 ancient empires. How did Rome grow? Because it was all economy that created that, that growth yeah. of that empire. And then it was economy that, that contributed to its decline. As soon as the monetary system got corrupted, um, as soon as kind of more and more slaves were kind of stolen, as soon as they couldn't pay all the right things in the right amounts mm-hmm. and, and pay for the military, um, then they just started to get sacked by the Huns and the tribes, the Goths and so on that came into the borders of Rome. Hmm. And, and he maps as well the, the Dutch, the British, ancient Chinese, the French and German, Japanese. The yeah, like the tulip craze, you know? You know? Yeah. Different, the different uh, crazy, you know, explosions of different markets that collapsed and bankrupted everybody in sight. It's yeah. All, it's, it's all been done before. Nothing new under the sun. That's why I say, you know, even this, this, you say. this medical crisis is, is not new. Yeah. Not at all new, but, but we've forgotten it. And we're so narrow-minded, so close-minded, and we don't learn their lessons from history, you know, that we think that, oh, poor us, this is affecting us. And why us? Why anybody in, in the history, you know? So, yeah, that's, that's a great, so that's what you mean when you're talking about perspectives. Like to, yes. to, so that, to step back out and look at it at the, at, you know, the, the spectrum of human nature and, and the economic cycles that have, have guided civilizations. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So, so the question is, how, first of all, how wide is your perspective? And how, and how wide can you make, how broad and how deep can you make your perspective through study? Like it doesn't come easy, the kind of study of empires that he's yeah. doing putting together in a body of work it's going to be a book later in the year um to to do that work to gather those perspectives is is hard and it takes time but the deeper your perspective and the further you are away from the momentary fluctuations the um the more liberating it is yeah and that's why why i say you i'm putting you in that bracket with ray dalio because when you tell a story about the crisis it's like oh yeah well, if i if i study the mm. bubonic plague I've got this great story of Isaac Newton and his Annus Mirabilis. <laughs> so people now, like, people now in the kind of self-help, yeah, we can use this time to change and learn the language I always wanted to learn, you know, like, like, let's, and grow my business because I've got all this focus time. To actually have a story and have contemplated very deeply a story of like, oh, yeah, Isaac Newton was the greatest physicist of his time, one of the top three in history that mm-hmm. shaped the way that the world operates. Um, he had his best year, um, probably, perhaps even because of a plague. And it's exactly just, just to read that, I feel an instant liberation, like, oh, wow. And then if I read Ray Dalio and think, oh, well, why, we might be on the end of a 90 year cycle. And um, there might be a superpower that's actually dwindling, like this kind of 
Yeah, shifting American sands, yeah. American superpower might be on the wane and the China one might rise and there might be a replacement in world currency and what your dollar's worth and who holds purchasing power in the world. It's been very nice to feel privileged to have a lot of purchasing power compared to people from other nations. And that might change. We'll have to taste what it's like to, to have the shoe on the other foot. Um, the closer I get to it, I'm in a panic. Mm -hmm. I want to protect. I want to protect my, my feeling yeah. of... Yeah. power and superiority and you can't touch me but what if the shoe's on the other foot and the idea that that's happened many times before i you know my whole existence is contemplating history and and that's where my lessons came from that's where my quote-unquote therapy if there's any kind of therapy is from stories of the past you know like and and it, and and i and i completely convinced that you know there's nothing new under the sun and it's, we, we, we're learning, we have the same needs, the same, you know, cycles. It, it, you're hundred percent accurate on this, Jordan. And it's like, um, I'm always putting my that perspective on the, the length of a life and the length of that life in the context of other lives and the, of civilization and what we're trying to create and, and, and legacy, you know, I, legacy is a big word that you and I toss back and forth like a, like a tennis ball all the time, you know? It's like, le like a living legacy, the legacy that of, of your life when you're on your deathbed. Some of my early talks was all about that, you know, like mm. contemplating what, what kind of life do you, in memories, do you want to, one of the early things that I was known for saying was, you know, what are the greatest memories that I can make? That should be the only guide in life. If you're in a fork in a road, I remember saying this years ago, I forgot about it almost, you know, you had a fork in the road and you can go left or you can go right. You, and, and you have two options in life. The only guide that you should do is, 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 is which one will give me the best memories when I'm old? Which path yeah. do I think will give me the best memories when I'm old? And so there's a lot, I, there's a, I, I have a huge step back perspective. And maybe that's, maybe that's the only thing that, maybe that is my only gift, you know? Like I step back and I really reflect on the whole thing, the whole flow. And we're, you know, we're this glimpse of time, you know, like, we're this moment in time and that's it. And, and I'm fascinated by time and, and yeah. Einsteinian uh, concepts of time and the physics of time. And, and, you know, is, is, is time like a, a 3d printer that, you know, it just keeps going like this. And, and we're here on the, on the edge of the hot, the hot plastic of it, you know, and I, I I'm fascinated by it. I'm completely fascinated by it. And so like, I've got just on my shelf up there, I've got like, six or seven books on string theory and I'm fascinated by it. Blows my mind. Dark matter. I want to know and yeah. nobody knows. It's all theory. Right. Right. So, but, but that's a great concept, Jordan, that the stepping back into the perspective of civilization and your role at this time in history, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, how you went there or how you got there. And, and I think, cause this is a gift to, yeah uncover and then offer i would say that everyone each of us have a kind of center of gravity to which our attention on a daily to day basis goes yeah so the center of gravity is either on the fluctuations of the stock market and the anxiety of that or it's a little way back in like okay i'm gonna watch it all from a different perspective and get the, the 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 complexity and like wow and how the interconnectedness of everything i'm very much here like i could stand up with you in in public or in one of our groups in yeah. the conference and weave together all these different complexities and how they come together and wow like look at this amazing thing that's going on in the world and then you and you're coming from a step back in history and then you're just so i'm explaining this very difficult complex thing and you're like oh yeah because in the fourth century there was a guy <laughs> like this and i'm like oh like, <laughs> the 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 dizzying whirring of the world all of a sudden seems small and you come from a from a yeah. from a higher altitude so um i think the my question is how to kind of ground your day-to-day -day thought streams in a historical perspective how to do that and the why to do it is clearly because the peace of mind Mm -hmm. I think that one experiences and the depth of peace and perspective that one can give to others is, is. Yeah. Because perspective, perspectives puts you quote unquote in your place. You feel that you, 
you're not special. How many people came before you that had more trouble than you? And, you know, and I think for me, it's like, cause I grew up in Northern Can in Northern British Columbia in Canada. And my family was very, very close and very tight, but we were isolated um, from any kind of ancestry or historical, you know, I, I didn't know any of my relatives really, because we were so isolated in the North there. And, we, and I had no, pers and I was so fascinated by, you know, if I, it, uh, like where I came from and I had no perspective on it. Like you in England, you, you get a thousand year old church around the corner and kids are skateboarding around it. You know, it's like, it's so, so commonplace. And for yeah. me, when I see a thousand year, year old church still today, I, I'm in awe of what hath we wrought, you know, what, what has come, what a civilization has created that I'm now this, this, you know, we talk about creating culture. Ours and Rod is about creating culture. And it's, it's, we're creating this little infinitesimal slice of culture in our way. And we're adding onto the, another layer on that thousand year old church. And that blows my mind because in, in Northern British Columbia, there was nothing that's older than, you know, no building older than maybe 70 years or something, you know? And, and I found arrowheads when I was a kid, you know, I'd find an arrowhead, but the, the, the native people that went before, that was the only trace. There was no trace of it, of, 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 you know, history, except for an arrowhead now and then. So it was just pure wilderness right. and will be carved in, in the last 60, 70 years it carved into the wilderness. And, 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 and when I was traveling back in the day and I would, I would find, or, or I, I would buy coins, like I, like medieval coins. I'd like, I'd go into a coin shops and if they had medieval coins, I would like buy a, you know, a, a, like a coin, a silver coin from the 1300s, Hungarian coin or British coin or English coin, stuff like that. And, and I would sit there in contemplation of how did, you know, how did this Roman coin get, from that Roman era to me in Canada, holding this on my hand, what soldier got it in his pay who went to a prostitute, she bought a loaf of bread, you know, and, it, and, it, and, and, and the, the, the movement of that, there's a great uh, movie with Samuel Jackson called The Red Violin. And it, and it shows this, you know, Stradivarius type violin from the 17th century and the hands it went through, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and, and, and now it's in, 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 in Sotheby's being auctioned off for millions of dollars. Oh my God. And it, and it shows the history of this red violin that, you know, in two different hands. And I'm fascinated by that trajectory of that flow. Like, and I, and I never felt I was connected to it. So I really had this emptiness in me that I'm not, I have no perspective. I have n just nothing but this nearby small little village of 800 people. Wow. Live, you know? And the cabins I lived in and the further yeah. I went out into the wilderness and, you know, you know, and, and fishing and, 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 and doing that type of thing. I was yeah. so removed from any sense of history that I, I, I was fascinated by history. And I, and I, I read the encyclopedias. It's basically the wow. only books we had was the world book encyclopedias. I read it A to Z because I was so fascinated and it was history still to this day. It blows my mind. I'm in Bucharest. And, 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 and I still have this sense of overwhelming awe of when I see, you know, a building that's, you know, 500 years old or right around the corner from me is some Roman ruins underneath glass, you know, mm. as you've seen. And I think, how, how can this be? How, you know, what is my place? I really think, what is my place in this, these Romans that came before, you know, Bucharest has got layers of city, you know, over yeah. centuries. As, as all as, as they all do and as all cities do and those layers that went below of forgotten people and someday we're going to be forgotten you know and you know when i was in in, in florence you go to the, the 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 churches there or the westminster abbey i always think about this you know and here's here's a a life-size knight stone on the ground like a like a, a a gravestone, I guess, or a, pl a marker, and it's worn down from centuries of, of feet. And all you can see is the bare outline of this noble knight and, and the bare outline of his sword and the bare outline of his shield and nothing left but that, that worn away 
image when he was so famous back in the day that they they thought to implant him in the in the bottom of Westminster Abbey and that's us and and that blows my mind and I, I I'm always sitting in the perspective of you know all the things we're trying to do are are as noble as anybody's ever tried to do and as trivial as anybody's tried to do you know and boom one of these days we we you know it, it's taken away from us and it fascinates me. And I'm fascinated by longevity too, like how to extend lifestyle and stuff like that, which is the new science that, you know, that everyone's talking about. Biohacking. Um, yeah, life hacking and how to, to, to extend, you know, human nature's this, this malady of growing old and how you can reverse it or stave it off. And I'm fascinated by these types of things. I'm fascinated by, you know, I, I'd love to live for 500 years because I, I have so much I feel like I want to understand and learn and I, I, don't, I don't have time. Incredible, man. Wow. Well, what I'm hearing is you, um, you grew up with a, with a lack or a, a perceived real lack of yeah. culture and history. Like, who are these people that live in big cities and, you know, where did my folk come from to end up in this part of the world? And it, it's like that sets off a, a fervor inside you. So when you find history yeah. and when you find culture, there's an amplified curiosity because it's, you never seen this before. And the kind of contemplation that you'll naturally go down, um, is, is quite extraordinary, like fueled by maybe what you didn't have. Like you, you sit there and you look at a coin and wonder about how that was yeah. passed from person to person, like the red violin. Um, most people won't do that. Oh, it's an old coin, you know, when I know. Are we when I are know. we going to go to the coffee shop or get the glass of wine at the end of this boring, yeah. <laughs> boring museum day that my, my kids or my wife has taken me on, right? Yeah, jo my... jo Joseph Brodsky said, there's, there's nothing so beautiful as the sight of ruins. And that, that completely is my sentiment. When I see something, when I see ruins overgrown with grass like that, I have to touch it. I have to reach out and touch it and I have to contemplate it and I have to sit there and I could sit there for hours just wondering who was here, who, who put this rock upon a rock and, and, and yeah. was proud of their, and was proud of their work. Who, who is, who would like that girl? and wanted to run, you know, run across the village and meet her. That, that gives me all, that's my perspective. You know, so that was, that's us. The way that, you will um, ask those questions so repeatedly and, and follow that kind of contemplative, contemplative cycle that adds up to you having this broad historical perspective. 100%, like, yeah. All, all these years on, that's why it's like, okay, there's a pandemic. Wow, this has happened not in my lifetime, but many lifetimes before. Let's have a look, let's see what stories. Isaac Newton had that and yeah. other inventors and he was trying to understand the physics and how how the cosmos works. And that gives me gratitude, Jordan. Like I talk about gratitude a lot and you know, ours and Rada, we have, you know, it's some of our strongest themes is gratitude is the opposite of, you know, being judgmental for instance. And, and, yeah. and gratitude is, has a, is, a, is, is a salvation type of energy, you know? And, 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 and I have gratitude for this poor young kid with no education, no money, you know, talk about, you know, <laughs> economic, you know, devastation no money never saw money never saw any kind of hint of money my whole growing up ever um and i get to and and i and i've arranged my life on purpose by by conscious effort to to you know with still without possessions but to sneak through the cities of the world and to and to and to go and reconnect to some kind of history and perspective you know that's yeah. why I could never live in a city that doesn't have history. Couldn't do it. Like, yeah, well, they say never, but you know, like, and I, and I'm most comfortable in the heart of a city or the heart of the wilderness, but the suburbs and, you know, that modern, you know, uh, you know, strip malls in America and stuff like that, just like, uh, just, I can't, I can't abide. So my whole so, pursuit is trying to find my historical, you know what, my whole pursuit in life and everything about ours and Rod and the Alabaster girl is trying to find my role at this time in history and you know my relationship to the rest of civilization to to men and to women and to and to art it's just my you know that's my why you know i think i could say hmm. and it, and i can't stop thinking about it my next book is about that 
<laughs> that's why I'm sitting in you know, contemplation and trying to write a book yeah. about it. it. It reminds me of the concept that everyone has got a question. Everyone's got a cool question that if they're um, maybe brave enough to go in and find or if they have wow. enough silence, that, that, that's what's so cool about this, hopefully about this cocoon time that, that we're in as a, as a world. In, in solitude and isolation, hopefully more people are getting, gonna get in touch with the core driving question, which is not, how do I get a girl's number or how do I sure. you know, go down and do this thing on the strip mall um, this weekend or where, where's everyone hanging out? Where's the party on yeah. Friday night? <laughs> it's not that question. The, question. the question is like, what, what's the nature Jeez. of culture? Because I've, I don't see that around me and what's my place in the time of history? We each have a, like what, what's the nature of the, uh, a woman's heart or what is arts that brings goosebumps? Like, I think most people have a question that's attached to their core, like a kind of soul born but they thing. Can't, but, but a they question. Can't. Yeah, yeah. Almost like a, my, a mystical tradition would say the yeah. question that, that pre-existed before you were born and that right. you carry right. deep but inside you, you and your whole life is to uncover what that question was and to slowly begin answering it. And then, by the end of your life, you are the, you are the embodied answer to the question and your legacy is actually the gift of a question answered onto the next people. And most people will never come close to the understanding of what that core question is because of life. We, you know, we, we exist and we, we eat and we, we get jobs and, um, I don't know, but you know, like maybe f I'm, I'm thinking about the, what I, you know, what I, how I presented that, this idea that my whole pursuit since I was very young is to try and find my relative my my relevant place in history not my role necessarily but to connect to the flow you know to connect to the ancient flow of, of humanity and now I land and that flows past me I can't stop thinking about it and, I, and that is my big question and that's why I'm so fascinated by you know longevity physics uh, music. It's just, there's, I'm consumed with it. And I don't know how to elucidate it, elucidate that clearly, but it's really, that's approaching very closely what my whole, you know, uh, modus operandi is, you know, what, why, why? My, what what's my, to... what's my place in the flow? What's kind of, what's my place in the tapestry? A lot of people ask that kind of question. Yeah. And is there legacy and is there afterlife and is there, you know what you know and and you know the the whole molecule spread out and is there something else in the universe you know yeah are we the only i these kind of questions consume me and i'm just fascinated by it and i'm not going to answer any of these questions any more than anybody else did but i want to know for my own self when i'm 95 years old and i'm looking back and i'm scratching myself i'm thinking you know man i sure had to i sure took a good look at it I sure <laughs> wanted to you know I sure <laughs> like, like, like the guy you talked about in the last podcast you know, I'm 95 and I look back at my works and I try to have the essence had of all these answers. the time space continuum and the nature of beauty and damn, that was kind of, and I failed. I failed. <laughs> just the way he said, he's this old guy sitting like this, he's all bent over, he's trying to get his porridge in his mouth and he goes, you know, I wrote these books on, on philosophy and our existence of consciousness and, you know, and the duality of mind and all these wonderful books in the 50s and 60s. And I had this idea, you know, to, to set out to, to say something important about this. And I failed. <laughs> Just incredible. I want to, um, of course, like everyone in our group and community and audience, like the majority of people are, are trying to find on some level, what is their core question? Yeah. Or like, what is their, their, their honest path, the kernel of the, 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 the whisper of the sublime or whatever that lives inside them that they ought to be following. If I'm to obey this thing, then my life is going to end up being right and just. Yeah, no question. And it is, it's the only thing that has value. That, that inquiry is the only thing that has value as far as I'm concerned. So my, most, here's where I get curious about your journey um, and your life from beginning to now is because I think the majority of our community are going in the other direction to you in a way, which is that trying to find the core question, trying to live like the alignment and meaning, of course. But you've come out of almost pure nature and you've ended up in culture and you've ended up seeking history and seeking culture and being among the kind of ruined cities of the world. 
yeah. and, and seeing your traje- trajectory. The majority of people um, growing up nowadays with access to education and the internet and all this kind of output that we're doing um, are coming from the opposite where they've grown up skateboarding outside of a thousand year cathedral and probably spending more time than they should uh, having grown up playing computer games Mm -hmm. or stuck behind a monitor or even um, you know playing with a phone or an iPad before they're 10 years old and so dating just happened through a tinder or connection just happened through a a messenger and not the face-to-face more people are going from the technological world to and yeah. trying and then really looking like, why do I feel fragmented? Why does connection with other people feel a little bit stifled? Why, why does the city feel somehow unfulfilling, but I've got yeah. no other way of finding my deeper connection or integration within myself. I feel like something's off and it's hard to find what is off because the urban environment has so much. Where, what, what is the source of my in, inner incompleteness? Yeah. And I think you've said a lot over the years, like uh, um, I disagree with this um, kind of one nation under therapy, this continual navel gazing, let's try and go into the emotions of my past and do my psychotherapy and analyze who I was and how I became right. who I was. I wonder if a big part of that actually came a big part of your not feeling cool or like you need to go down that path of self kind of fixing and therapizing because you grew up in an abundance of nature, which has. Mm, That's a good point because we were very poor, but we had, we were surrounded by nature, you know, and, and there's part of me that, you know, you can never take it out of the nature out of your soul, you know, and there's part of me that's, that is going back to that. Like, um, like I'm in the cities of the world, but there's some part of me that is, is really drawn to the, you know, the cabin by the lake chopping wood. And, and now I'm not saying I'll do that because I'm fundamentally lazy, <laughs> you know? Um, but there's something in me that, that, um, so I'm down the technological path too. Like I'm a technophile. I love technology. I was a computer programmer. And I, I think it's cool. I'm always watching the newest developments in futurism and stuff. And I like it, you know. Um, but at the same time, I'm really drawn to that, that, that whisper of the wilderness. The, the wilderness, you know, once you have the wilderness in your heart, you know, it never leaves. And, and, I, and, I, could st- and I, I, I daydream or I dream about the, the rustling of the, the, the poplar leaves, you know. They had this like rustling sound that you can never hear anywhere else. The north of, of British Columbia poplar and birch trees and the leaves are going like this and, and turning colors like this because the wind is blowing and you're rustling and and i'll never forget that sound and the smell and you know sort of thing so that's in my heart you know and i miss it um not i don't miss it enough to to migrate anywhere close to it now because <laughs> you know i'm in an apartment <laughs> but um there's something in it that i you know it's it's this it's my connection to this flow of life is really what I've tried to understand all these years. It really is. I felt so disconnected and discombobulated and apart from the, the march of civilization. And yet all I read, because I read encyclopedias, right, uh, was, and I would read these things when I was a kid, like of far away distant lands, you know, Rudyard Kipling or whatever. Right? I would read these things and I would be in awe and wonder and daydream and, and dream, you know, I was always, and so there's something in me that had to go to see, quote unquote, like, like anybody, in, you know, did before me. And, uh, whew, yeah, that's, that's, um, it's interesting for me that, you know, that we brought it up in this context in this way, because that's really the pursuit of what I've been trying to understand for myself. Yeah, I, I'm convinced that there's a there's a tremendous healing and integrative power of nature that is you know if you want to take a group of people and have them feel more whole and relaxed and grounded and yeah you have to commune with nature just go and stick them in nature put them on a minibus and stick them in nature for a week and see what happens like when when you're immersed with with the the freshness and the sound and the rustling of leaves and so on it becomes very your human urban problems really do fade a long way yeah. away. And I think someone who is uh, brought up in that, is, I think, has got to have um, 
a, a real robustness in their heart and soul, hmm. which is I, I am from this, I am connected to this, I am at home. If I go out camping for a weekend, I'm not going to be worried about getting mud on my trainers, on my shoes. Um, I'm just going to be able to like go and forage and have an adventure. And if we have to cross a river, we'll be able to figure it out and jump through it. You know, like this kind of core mm-hmm. set of, but I think some of the experiences that are leading me to, to believe this more and more is, you know, that we did a vision quest a, a few years ago with 10 members of the Amarasi. We went off to France and we sat there for four days, yeah. four nights in nature, no food, no technology, nothing. And, and that's a, talking about this notion of poverty in the ancient Chinese that would go to the edge of civilization. That was the old right of passage. All you poets went. (laughs) If you get killed by a bear or a wolf, um, then you were just not meant to graduate it and you were too weak of a child to actually come back to the tribe. So there was a real life and death thing to Mm. it. People actually died in their rites of passage. It was a way of of weeding out the chat. Um, But we sat there for four days and four nights and it's like, Wow, in the, in the immensity of this, that does a whole lot of um, work and provision of insight and provision of wholeness and inspiration for people that nothing else does. So in, in some of the more recent workshops that I've been doing, the, the guys will come in, we'll do a couple of days of coaching, we'll have the women in the room, we'll do a whole exploration of what they want. And just when they're cooking, we'll go out to the waterfall and the guy will and we'll be like, okay, we're going to do a bit of like practice getting the body and then it's going to be two hours of do what you want in the waterfall. And the guys would just go off in nature and then they'll come back and be like, oh, that was the most. And I would mm-hmm. speak to them a couple of months down the line. Yeah, the workshop was amazing, but the real moment it all kicked in was when I stood underneath the waterfall and it was like nature, just all the emotions and the, 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 the problems that I thought I had and all that anxiety that I was carrying with me, I stood under the waterfall and it washed the whole thing away. And ever since that happened, yeah, it just hasn't been a problem anymore. Yeah, that's great. And, and, it, and it's yeah. wonderful. I think there's something so core to this that you've kind of grown up with, the, with this lack of uh, history and culture. And so your, your curiosity to get that and what that's ended up giving you for your life has been so immense. Mm. I think going in the other direction, okay, I grew up in, an, you know, there's kids in London that have never seen a cow or don't know where milk comes yeah. from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> right? So, so for, the, for others of us, it's like, how can we go out to the wilderness, like where you grow up and, and what can be found in there? And I think that's going back to this poverty, the vision quest. Yeah, that's a very interesting perspective, you know, that's really interesting because yeah. I, I was craving this connection always craving it and others are craving the rawness of the existence of, you know, communing with nature. And, and, uh, I, I, you're onto something and and we have to make these, these pilgrimages, right. To to find the true essence of ourselves and see what we're made of. You know, that's so interesting. People say, Oh, you, you're from, you know, Vancouver. I'm not really from Vancouver, but I tell people I am because that's what they, you know, I'm from way north of Vancouver. Well, you're from Vancouver, such a beautiful city. Yeah, it, it's, the mountains are beautiful all around it, right? And then in the north is mountains. And if you like rollerblading and and hiking and mountain bike and stuff, you're gonna you're gonna love Vancouver. It's like the whole city's built around that, you know. But I came out of the the wilderness and the mountains and the hiking energy, and I wanted to move into the the cafe culture of you know the modern city. You know, New York City fascinates me. I think it's just, a, it's, I, I love New York City. I love being in the, in the, you know, come out of Penn Station. We would take the, the train, the Amtrak train from Montreal down to Penn Station 10 hours. And you come out of Penn Station and it's like you emerge into this, the smells and the honking of the horns and just the, the aliveness of it is just phenomenal. And it's just very much the, like the wilderness for me, right? And there's... So, so there's something in me that is, was drawn away from the, 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 you know, the mountains and the quiet streams, which I adore. You know, I sat for hours and hours and hours and hours beside a quiet stream all my, all my childhood, you know, and or rivers. We would swim naked in the rivers and, you know, try and cross the river without drowning. And, it, you know, and it takes you down a thousand yards before you get to the other side because it's so swift. And we would like, <laughs> did we make it? Yeah, we made it. Now we can go back again. You know, you, 
you, you start the swimming way up here, the crossing way up here, because you know, you know, before the rapids, you got to get across. And we yeah. didn't know how to swim. We learned how to swim in a slough, you know, like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pond scummed, you know, tadpole pole filled, like, you know, thing. And then whatever version of swimming we did. So, yeah, but then my journey has been into wanting to sit into the, like I said, the technological wonders of civilization, which I didn't see. Yeah. Incredible. That's yeah. perspective, huh? Yeah. I think those perspectives of nature will, will never leave a person who's had them. Like yeah. every, every excursion. I know you've, you've always spoken on podcasts in the past. Yeah, you know, there were, there were five guys going on a fishing excursion, but I didn't go because there were no the women. It's like, what's the point in that? I'm starting. Oh, there's no women out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm starting to see like the power of an excursion. Um, people ask me like, why, why, why do you seem so peaceful and your, your mind is so calm? Um, I'm like, well, I've sat. We went to the Atacama Desert. In, right in the north of Chile and Bolivia. Yeah. We, we did this trip. I, story for another podcast, I got kidnapped in Bolivia. It was like kidnapped at yeah, gunpoint. that's a great story. Held hostage and tied up. And it was, you know, we could have been shot and pistol in the mouth. Um, I'll tell that story another day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember being tied up and begging God, like if, you know, I didn't believe in God at the time. Um, I get out of this. <laughs> But God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll go straight home to England to my mum's house and I'll never go traveling again. You know, I'll get the corporate job that everyone wants me to have. We, we were out there for two days and we were like drinking beer in the garden, telling our story to all the girls, you know, on the backpacker trail. We went after that, we traveled through Bolivia and we got to this um, salt flat, Salade Uyuni. Can't pronounce that without practicing my tongue <laughs> positioning. Uh, Salade Uyuni. Um, it's, it's a salt flat some people watching would have seen this or might have even been but in for six months of the year the whole thing is covered in water so you look about you look upon it and it's just water like this as far as the eye can see oh the, yeah like a skip of it right yeah so so you look up and it's blue sky and clouds and you look down and it's blue sky and clouds yeah reflected and yeah and then and then the other six months of the year which is when we saw it um the whole thing turns to kind of like ice slash salt it's like this salt mm. layer and it down cracks so you've got the the white the the blue in the sky but and it's pure blue by this point there's no clouds and you look upon it and it's just pure white as far as the eye can see and then you can do things like take a picture and there's no sense of perspective so you sit there like that and your friend is sat mm. there in your hand and you know you're, wow. you're picturing you sat on top of a whiskey bottle and the perspective is all jumbled up so so it's it, it's like this moonscape land that that looks like nothing that you imagine would exist on earth and we went we went across it for three days and two nights in a jeep and it was just beautiful there was three of us guys there were three girls in the <laughs> in a jeep we managed to buy red wine so every night we'd go out <laughs> freezing our asses off, drinking this red wine under under the immensity of that and and on top of this thing and there's nothing to do like there's no there's no phone in those ages mm. there's no reception anyway so all, all we can do is tell stories to each other about what we saw what we did what we dream of for the future and we came out of that and, and the landscape changes from this kind of white thing and it starts getting more um desert like so there's little green shrubs here and there and there are a few lagoons there's this blue lagoon and a green lagoon and the blue is so blue and the green is so green and everything starts getting a bit more sandy and rocky it's kind of like a um you know, Luke Skywalker, where <laughs> growing up, kind of desert planet. We ended up on this, um, the Atacama Desert, which is very famous. It's the highest desert of the world. It's, if you want to look at the stars, it's the best place in the world because it's the mm. highest desert and the clearest sky. There's no lights around it, just observatory. And again, we, we took our bicycles out into the desert and we rode and we got lost on the way home because we didn't, it got dark and we couldn't see which dune or which, um, mm -hmm kind of thing that we turned behind Your perspective <laughs> we lost our bearings and then we're i'm shitting myself for a good half an hour because there's nothing in the sky and it looks like it's going to be pitch black then the moon comes out from over the horizon it's this massive beaming moon and the stars are full it's like every constellation wow. this desert doesn't have any Beautiful. desert no cloud ever goes past it um 
So we cycle back. I think there's like, yeah, the three guys and three girls on bikes. And, and we're, we get our salvation by the light of the moon. And we come back to town and yeah, there's a bottle wow. of red wine waiting and a nice meal. And it's like... So part of you went into the wilderness in, in your life. Like you, many times you migrated into an isolated type of, you know, away from civilization. Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of excursions, which has been beautiful, but I've never kind of grown up or spent a year of my life grounded in nature, you know, where I would right. keep a cabin kind of Walden style and be self-sufficient on the land or grow up and adventure and the kind of, you know, the, 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 the trees and the indigenous children of my friends <laughs> and we'd shoot with slingshots like, no, I, I don't have that in my veins, but I want it. <laughs> and I think the, the last part of my life is, um, I believe that there's something about I think we've formed like our, our psyche and who we are and how we're showing up is in, in grand part formed by the people that we have relationships with, the cultures that we're immersed in, the history that we've been privy to and the, the nature that we're also mm. in communion with. And it's like, as they say, if, if, if you go into a room and everyone in that room is more interesting than you and you get to hear those stories and absorb that, you become the, the aggregate of the people that you surround yourself That's by correct, yeah. nature as well. Like if you're someone that, that has seen some amazing things like that landscape is if, if I want to meditate or calm my mind, I can just remember to karma and it's like an anchor in my spirit of like, I know what it's like to be on the highest desert of the world and just stare out and have the pure sky. Like it's always and forever with me. I think that the second part of my life is going to be heading out into the most mm -hmm. extreme landscapes possible. Like I've, I've wow. done the, the coffee culture and yeah. all this, another fancy coffee shop with another, Oh, your, your beans were ground in Ethiopia. I grew up in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Here's another philosophy book on my iPod. Exactly. You know? <laughs> um, but, but I, I see myself as moving more into this um, intrepid kind of explorer. That's cool. Archetype. That's I want to cool. see the Himalayas and, and see what is it like Tibet? What is it like the desert of Uzbekistan, the Silk Road, yeah. these mythical places. And I, I think... That's fascinating, man. Yeah. You want to expand your mind? Something about that. You're a real adventurer, you know? So, yeah. You would have been in the, in, in the, the darkness of Africa... 200 years ago. I've been in, the dark, been in the darkness of Africa seven years ago. <laughs> slashing through the, through the, the, the mach machete. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I think lineage archetype wise, I've got this kind of Victorian British explorer. Yeah, kind of, you certainly do. Like you have that, uh, that intrepid. But, fin but finish the day with a cup of tea or a gin and tonic. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, exactly. I'm not, I'm not banshee it's like the, style. It's, it's like the British explorers where, you know, like, slash the way through the jungle and then they'd set up their tea set and you know they're, they brought it all with them you know their little table and chairs you know exactly their umbrella I'll, and their umbrella oh no, I've, got some, I've got some crease into my linen safari costume <laughs> and they're I have to iron that one out <laughs> yeah man. set up all perfectly that's funny yeah i understand it man you know like i did the the interview with james marshall from the natural lifestyles a few weeks ago Right. And, right. you know, and he's, you know, traveled and been this dating coach and stuff like that. And fascinating because he was in Coimbra, Portugal, where we've been. Where we've been. Yeah. 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 And he, he f saw a farm, a finca. I don't know what they call it in Portugal. Right. And he bought the farm and, it, hmm. and yeah. And he's, you know, got goats and chickens and, and he's got plans and he's, in, and he's been, landscaping it and planting trees and, and, and recreating an olive grove. And he centered his whole future onto this farm. And it's fascinating to me. Like there's yeah. something I really, really admire that, you know, I think that's, yeah. he's, he's a fantastic, interesting guy. And I could never do it because I, I can't do chores. I'm lazy. I had to do, you know, feeding chickens and stuff when I was a kid and, yeah. and I'm not good at it. And, but it, 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 it really fascinates me that he had this impulse to buy a farm and he's, his whole future centered around it. And what, what, what was his motivation? Sure, you explored that. Yeah, he just basically said that, you know, he just, it, he just really wanted to feel it, the, the land and 
you know, and to, and to own this piece of land and to, and to shape it into something. And, and he has intentions. He's not, he's not quitting his, his coaching, but it's more, it's, he, he wanted to more like have a, a, a like a, a retreat center there. He wants to create something out of it. He's creating an amphitheater, like a, like a, a, a like a, like a, you know, a, a Greek step amphitheater in, in, in the olive grove. He's got all these yeah. plans and it's immense. I don't mean immense necessarily in size, but, the, but the, you know, here's the well and here's the, and, and all these things need to be taken care of, you know, and, and there's chores. It's a, it's a life of chores. So it's a, it is kind of a self-sufficient place, a self-sufficient yeah. kind of village or even yeah. kind of kibbutz. And I'm completely impressed by it, you know, because I grew yeah. up on a farm like that and there was always, you know, fences to fix and, and the cows got out and you got to find the cows somewhere in the middle of kingdom come, you know, and, yeah. and we had all this, we grew up with pigs and cows and horses and, you know, and, and doing chores and stuff like that. And, and I, and, and I admire that in him because I miss it, but I can, but I'm too lazy to go and, you know, take that on myself. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not your story. No. It, and it, if, it's it, amazing. Like this, this generation of guys that, um, have lived an international life, online business, chasing girls, you know, the, the urban thing. Yeah. It's almost like you get to a point in your life and this is what I'm talking about as well. Like, Hey, wait a minute. I spent all my life traveling, but I've been, I've, I've been in the, in the psychology great. and in the computer and building this kind of writing and everything The the polarity flips. And it's like, I want to taste the other side of life and me. Like I don't yeah. see myself as the farmer, but the like to, to the just adventurer. cut out and say like, wow, I hit midlife. I'm going in a different direction. Like, cause at some point it's going to end. I don't want to die and be like, I never trekked wow. in the Himalayas or I never I, knew I have this. A lot I, of, I never went across Siberia, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I never saw that crooked tree in Namibia with the. Wow. Yeah. I have a lot of respect and admiration for that. I really do. Like, you know, it, there's no difference. Good on him. That's cool. Between him going into, you know, centering on this, this, this farm and this project in, you know, yeah. outside of Coimbra somewhere and you going off into the, into, you know, intrepid adventures. I think what else can you look up to than that? In my mind, like there's, there's a, that's, that's fantastic. That's living. That's an existence. That's putting your, your play, your mark in history. Your what I've been seeking, you know, and, and it, for me, I can see my end days very likely going to be very quiet, sitting somewhere surrounded by books in a cabin, you know, by a little <laughs> mountain stream. And I can feel that like that, that when I'm done with the cities, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I'm moving back into the, you know, my, my roots, which is the very simplicity. I remember when I was a kid living in a log cabin by myself, 13 years old, that was the size of, you know, a piece of plywood, you know, it's like, it, and there's, a, there's a, 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 a stove in the, in, in the corner that would last for half an hour because it was so small and it's freezing cold in the winter. And you light the fire and you, you crawl underneath your, your, your quilt, your, your feather quilt, and the fire goes out in 30 minutes because it just can't sustain. And just freezing, freezing cold and you're by yourself and I would lay in the bed and cry because I was so alone and, and you know, scared and, and, uh, and, and as, as a kid. And all I had was a journal and a kerosene lamp and a, and a, and a feather quilt that was about this thick. That's all my possessions. That's, I had nothing else. And I would write in that journal you know, you know, uh, you know, and I would just write stuff like, oh, the weather was, you know, the, oh, the thermometer outside says minus 23. And I would just write, and I saw a wolf today. I would just write these things down, you know, and as a kid, I was 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And I kept a journal for four or five years. I still have it, <laughs> you know, and it's in these blocky handwriting in my left hand, I'm left-handed. And I would just document what, you know, the temperature, what I saw that day. And, you know, I made some snowshoes out of willow. You know, and, 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 you know, and it was not easy and, and, uh, uh, incredible. And, and there's some part of me that's going back there, you know, yeah. I feel it, but way farther in the distance, like I'm not ready to hang up my spurs yet, you know? Yeah. Incredible. How can you be anxious about the state of the world when all these things are possible? You can't. And in the perspective of, of history that we're, People have gone through civilizations and, and, and communities have gone through way worse devastation. You know, I, when I was in Florence, you know, like you think about the, the people that were stuck in Florence in World War II 
or in Romania where I am. You know, Picasso got stuck in France and he had, he was what the Nazis called degenerate, degenerate art. And yeah, so he, and was, he, cho he chose to stay behind in his little cabin that he exactly. had down by the sea, right? Yeah. And he just was hoping I'll keep my head down and be quiet. You know, he partly chose, but partly it's, you know, he, I mean, he had influential people in the States that could have got him out of there, but most people didn't have the choice. They couldn't get papers to leave. So yeah. they had real anxiety of real fear of what's, you know, this army's coming in. And, you know, and, and, and that wasn't that long ago. So I think about that, you know, Picasso and some of these artists like just hunkered down and hope for the best and hope the food wasn't going to run out and hope they weren't going to get discovered and, you know, and, and brutalized and sort of thing. And, and so, so, so how special are we that, you know, we're in this self-isolation self quarantine and everybody's complaining about it, you know? We're, we're like, uh, I have my rights to, you know, well, yeah, but, you know, like, man, I tell you, you look at the perspective of history and what, what people went through before. And, you know, in 19, you know, 18, the, this, you know, this, right after World War II, the Spanish flu just devastated the world. And everybody's wearing masks and forced to wear masks and no gatherings over 10 people. You know, same thing we, we have now, but we think, oh, this happened to us and, you know, why us, you know? <laughs> anyway, that's perspective for you. I could keep going on about this. Incredible. Yeah. We, we had one, you just mentioned Florence. We had one question from the pilot episode. Um, mm. Why did you go to Florence for a month and stay in a hotel room when you could have stayed, you know, at home or in a hotel room just up the road? Oh, <laughs> yeah. The the viewer wanted to understand like why yeah. why go overseas. And you know, I thought of a bunch of different places to go. I wanted to I wanted to go south, uh, but I, I didn't want to go to a place where like a, a year before I went to Vamaveke, which is the sea, the Black Sea, and I went there for a month, right? And I sat yeah. there for a month. Um, but I didn't want to go to any place that were, there was any distractions outside of my room. I, I didn't want to leave the room. So Florence obviously is full of distractions and, you know, the history and, you know, the, the museums and stuff, the Pizzi gallery and stuff like that. But uh, I, did, I went there because, I don't know, it just appealed to me. I'd been there before. Uh, but I didn't go there to see Florence. I went there to hide in a Florentian, you know, um, room. And I was looking at other places and for some reason... The flight was cheap. I, got a, I was going to stay in a nunnery <laughs> you know, with the nuns, but I moved out of there because the room was too austere and cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ladies, I'm out of here. <laughs> Thanks. You, the guy from the Alabaster Girl, wants to stay in this nunnery? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the hotel next door, but I was thinking of other locations, but, um, but I had to leave. I had to, I had to go on a pilgrimage of some kind, you know? And, yeah. and, and, and I left Deanna behind in Bucharest working on her projects. And so, you know, for a month and, and there was some part of that separation that I needed to have too. Cause if I was here, if I just got in a hotel down the road, then the temptation and the, and the, and the opportunity to just like, man, we really miss each other. Uh, this, you know, let's, uh, I'll sneak over to my apartment sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And so I didn't want to have that. I wanted to be cut off from the world. And I disconnected my internet, as you know. And I, and I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't contact anybody, didn't answer emails, didn't do anything, which I do like, I, I kind of do that once a year because I want to sit and think and like scratch my head and wonder about life, you know, and do some writing and stuff. Here's, here's I, I noticed from my side of the world, the power of man's solitude in you in that time. So you wouldn't be, we wouldn't hear from you from six for six days. And then on Sunday you'd. Turn I up turned online it on Sunday, yeah. Yeah, we would catch up on a little bit of business, or whatever. Yeah. So um, the the pilot episode of of this this podcast yeah. came from you being in Florence, and and you had this amazing energy of not having taken any input in from the world or been in your day to day yeah. scenario or day to day relationships. So you kind of appeared on a Sunday with a purity which was powerful. Like this is me in my contemplation. It's unsoiled by. Yeah. The habit of, of my my surroundings and to the point of so we did yeah. the pilot episode and you remember the pilot episode there wasn't we weren't going to make a podcast we were going to make four promotional videos for our essentials program yeah. <laughs> we got on that and we totally screwed it up by just catching up on philosophy and i'm like trying to drag that back and make the content for the promotion it didn't work that's and, and the <laughs> podcast was born from that this youtube series was born from that and then a few days later, we got back on the phone and we did videos one and two for the Essentials 
yeah. launch sequence. The and again, thing we were supposed in to your isolation, you were on fire. Like, you know what? I was full of inspiration. And even this conversation, yeah. Jordan, like, like I'm sitting here biting, like it's, it's six o'clock in the morning for me or six, seven o'clock in the morning for me right now, right? Because I did this early. And I'm, I'm chomping at the bit because I, I want to, I, I, this really inspired me to get down to the business of, of, of working on my book and writing, you know, in the context of what we talked about today. And so this, you need this, this fire of collaboration and, and contemplation in, in conjunction with another, you know? So there's an inspiration that comes from it when you are, when you are sequestered. That's what I seek is, is the inspiration of the sequestering and, and the real, the battling of the loneliness and isolation, which is, which is everybody's in now, right? But you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not self-imposed. And I need that and I need those moments to, to disappear and to live in privation, you know? I yeah. eat one meal a day, barely. I eat one meal a day and I would, I would sit there and just, and, and my room is this hotel room size, you know, the bed behind me and I'm sitting at this desk. And I never left. I would stay in there for three days until the maid finally said, you know, I got to come before, you know, there's a dead body in there or something. I have to at least leave. So I let her in for half an hour and I'd go for a little stroll around the block. And then yeah. I, would, I would come back and, and sit, you know, day and night. Day and night blended together because even had my curtains closed. I didn't know if it was day or night. I, had, I isolated off from the, from the sunshine. It's birds springing outside, you know. So whether it was Florence or not was pretty irrelevant. It just felt no. at the right, right time. It was kind of the right place yeah. and distance. Yeah. It didn't the, matter. Like, and I picked Florence for, I can't remember why. And I was thinking of some other place that I, I almost went to, I was going to go to London actually. Hmm. I, was th I thought about London, but I have too many, you know, I, I wanted to go where they didn't have any friends that existed there sort of thing. And not because I'd be tempted to contact them, but I just, I just, you know, I just thought of where could I go? and. I don't know. And I wanted so, to sit in, in, in a pilgrimage type of place that was connected to some artistic history. So that's why Florence, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why London, because I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by Westminster, Westminster Abbey, right? And, and I always try and migrate there or places where there's cathedrals to sit in, you know, and, like, and to look up into the lofty heights of it. So I wanted to sit in that reverence, to find reverence where I was. And so Florence has that, you know, Florence is... Is, so what, is incredible. What, what I got from doing those four videos with you was um, seeing you, talking with you on the first two, we, we were totally inspired. Like your energy was totally inspired and with it, it my energy got inspired and then we <laughs> created number one and number two were great. When we came and, and you were like, yeah, let's finish off three and four when I get back to Romania in yes, like three so times remember, yeah. back on the phone. And then we, we opened up and I'm like, Zan, okay, you ready for number three? And I'm like, one and two were really good. Like, let's keep going at this pace. And I'm, I'm like, right, Dan, how's it going? And you're like, yeah, I'm back in Bucharest. And <laughs> I looked at my email box. and Oh, my um, goodness. The pile of emails. Yeah. All my friends, like, want to catch up with me. And they've got stuff that they've been waiting to tell me. And, and all of a sudden, it was like the habit and the the... the, the, the Day to day, I know you love your life in Bucharest, and you've chosen that city because you're inspired by it. But even still, it's full of habit, <laughs> yeah, right? and, and, yeah. and obligations. And, and like, yeah, remove a man from all that and put him in solitude in an inspiring place. Like I'm, I'm seeing the, the, the level of fire. Like I came back to my my old purple cabin in Thailand uh, last summer, a month before Adele came back. So I, I was there alone in that house. And it was rainy season, so some days I couldn't go out because it was 24 hours a day, kind of monsoon type stuff. I just sat hold up. I, I got on an extremely high kind of vibration, productivity, inspiration, oh. creative during that period. And as soon as she came, it was amazing when she came. And then after a while, the comforts at home, having a girl in the bed, I won't Routine. get up quite so yeah. early. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't do that extra painful exercise that I do when I'm alone and... Yeah, my energy just kind of withered and I got a bit more in the comfort zone of being with my woman. And yeah. there's something about that, that isolation, solitude that, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind it's of so your, necessary. I highly recommend it for anybody who wants to understand anything about their life to self-isolate and, and, you know, go into the wilderness. 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, yeah. man. There's a reason that, you know, I really, really, it's, it's the most incredible thing you can do. You come out with brimming with ideas and, and hope and, and, and abundance thinking, you know, you really do. 
but it has to be self-isolation without Self internet. Yeah. Yeah. Without internet, yeah, without That's input right. from the, the YouTube playlist and... Yeah, it's not just like sitting around. Yeah. Which is what, you know, this, this quarantine isolation is mostly for us, including me. Yeah. Like I'm sitting with Deanna and we sit in the evening, we talk a lot and, and, uh, and I'm not super productive because of the, you know, the, the energy in the air of, of this uncertainty and stuff. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm not focused and productive, but I'm also saying, you know, that's the way it is. I don't beat myself yeah. up. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm relaxed in it. I, I hang out with my girl. I look out the window, see what's happening. See if there's anybody out there in this ghost town. And then, you know, hang out with my girl a bit more. What else is there in Cy life, you know? Cy cycles of the moon, right? There's going to yeah. be a time when Jupiter is in the right house and Saturn has come around in the right angle and then everyone in the world will get productive and that's where you launch your amazing thing and get there enlightened. <laughs> it's, it's all, um, it's happened many times. It's, it's never happened in my lifetime, but it's happened many times before. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so there you go. Great. Let's wrap up. Yeah, perfect. I could, it, was, it was good. It's energizing to me. I'm inspired and I, and I want to go and write now, you know, R write this concept of this point in this flow of history. It just blows my mind. I can't stop thinking about it. So you're, you're in your office, right? Recording this. So you'll yeah. be able to pick up your book and just get on with it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, yeah, I have a studio that I, I rent ne next or close to my apartment and I'm in yeah. there right now. Cool. I'm going to um, get some breakfast and take a dip in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> nice life. <laughs> no kidding, okay. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll be productive tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. No. Yeah. Productive what else in life is there? Right you know, like, yeah. No. Free beer tomorrow. Eat, drink, and be merry, and love the girl you're with. You know. What else is there? So, yeah. 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 Okay. Excellent. Um, Good talking to you, Jordan, and I'll talk to you again soon. I hope everybody enjoys the series. Sign up for our, uh, or subscribe. I don't know how you do that, but subscribe to our channel because we want to put out this regularly. And it's going to be a, yeah. it's going to be a rambling conversation about whatever is on our hearts, really, right? And, and Yeah, and today, today, has been very, today has been very long and very rambling and with a lot of different sections and topics, I would love to hear what 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 you got what was most impactful for you as a viewer um yeah what insights you're getting yeah how, how this might have shifted or giving you yeah, something because different. your comments will will inform our future ramblings for sure yeah subscribe and comment share it you know so other people can see it because we don't want subscribers beautiful Excellent. all right thanks jordan see you next time